Thank you so much, everybody, for being uh, this uh, afternoon with us. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, host, uh, uh, in the name of the Green Differ Group in the European Parliament and of the European uh, Green Party as well, uh, this uh, webinar on the, what, the so-called green recovery. Uh, we've been working very, very hard uh, in the last months from the European Parliament, first in the legislative procedure, to make really this instrument a real tool for change towards an ecological, social uh, and, and feminist transition in Europe. I have to say that uh, it is extremely relevant the moment we are living now because after the legislative phase, we are now entering the phase of implementation of the instrument. And as many of us want this instrument to be a success because we want really this to be the seat of a real fiscal uh, uh, tool for the European Union. We need this to be a success. Huh? And that's why we need that the different national recovery plans are delivering in the different tools uh, and the different objectives that the regulation sets. Firstly, in the green area, where we want that the 37% climate spending is respected and that the do not significantly harm principle, which applies to the whole regulation, is fully respected. Secondly, we, will all, we want also the gender equality uh, and social spending are, is a key element of the instrument. And we are asking these days the Commission really to be sure that all different national uh, plans have a strong component in terms of gender equality. And thirdly, and this we will be discussing this today as well, we of course want that this instrument is also uh, implemented in full respect of rule of law and fundamental rights. And we are uh, increasingly worried about the situation uh, in, in some member states. Hungary, for sure, is one of the cases where we are looking very closely, and that's why I'm very happy that the mayor of Budapest will be joining us for the first panel uh, this morning, but not, but not only in Hungary. So voila, those are three aspects that we want to, uh, to analyze today. Firstly, what is going on when it comes to the green spending and the do not significantly harm? Are, we re are the national recovery plans respecting it? Secondly, and that will be, uh, we will dedicate also a panel uh, with that. Are the national recovery plans really boosting gender equality and social cohesion? And thirdly, and with this panel we will start, is really this instrument being applied in full respect with fundamental rights in the different member states. I can only say that uh, this uh, uh, organization of this webinar has been uh, extremely difficult, uh, and but has been a success. And I want to thank particularly all the team, uh, Moshe, Petra, Christian, Jerun, Mar, Juan Carlos, Diana, and Jesus, for being really, really, really into the, uh, uh, into the organization. And now also from a, a, a practical point of view, I would like everybody, all the participants, to know that this webinar will have translation in German, in Spanish, in Italian, in French, in English, and Hungarian. And you can click in the menu if you need translation uh, to uh, to get it. You can click and select the language you, uh, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you want to use. And finally, also, in each of the panels, we will give the, the opportunity also to the participants to take the floor. You can, you can either take the floor directly, we will uh, give also the possibility of people to intervene, or either you can paste also the, the questions into the chat, both here in the, in the Zoom, but if you are following the, the, the webinar through the YouTube channel, you can also post the questions in the chat of our YouTube channel. So these are different ways on how you can interact with the panels. So thank you so much again, uh, all of you for being with us, and I will immediately now hand over to Vula Setsi, a member of the of the board of the of uh, the European Green Party, uh, and also the Secretary General of the Greens in the European Parliament, uh, to uh, to take us to the first panel. Pula, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ernest. Uh, very happy uh, to have all of you today here with us. Uh, this is not the first time that the European Green Party is uh, taking care and debates on the Recovery Resilience Fund. So we have already two webinars, but we believe that this one uh, is uh, uh, the real one, let's say, and the most important, also because uh, now we have the plans in front of us, so we can really discuss not in abstract, but on the issues that uh, we have and they have been proposed by the governments. And as we know, the timing is really important because in some days from now, we will have the first decisions that they will be taken at the level of the council mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the real debate 
also public debate more than ever starts because now the plans are transparent so we can also have this public confrontation in front of us. Uh, the panel that I have the honor to, uh, to organize uh, with you is uh, very much focused on the recovery for our democracies and the rule of law. And I think that politically, as mentioned before, Ernest, this is a key momentum. And I would like just to mention two or three things to give the political context. As we know, uh, some weeks ago, some days ago, we have uh, the European Council meeting and in front of the new decision that it was taken by Orban to adapt uh, to adopt a law on LGBTQ, you have for the first time, you had for the first time a clear political expression from the member states, something that never have been so clear before with a letter, an open letter, and also with a kind of clear indignation when it comes to the attitude of urban on issues linked to fundamental rights. And I will say that this is an historical momentum because as we follow until now, the council was not so uh, clear when it comes to what they would like and how they would like to follow the article seven, not only for Hungary, but also for Poland. And the fact that you have leaders of member states, which they uh, really ring a bell alarm and they ask Orban uh, to withdraw uh, the, uh, the law because, and of course, to change the political situation because if not there will be political consequences at the level of the council this gives us somehow a certain hope that also at the level of the council we will have uh, some uh, clear indications that when it comes now to the instrument of the recovery a resilient plan they will not just stay there and look but they will politically act so this is the first uh, issue when it comes to the attitude of the council when it comes to the attitude of the european parliament in the initiative on the initiative of our political group already next week we will have uh, uh, different activities for a public debate when it comes with the resolution when it comes to the Hungarian law, uh, but also for a debate when it comes to the conclusions of the General Affairs Council, which took place some days ago. And uh, they have discussed, they had, they had a hearing on uh, uh, the Article 7 on Hungary and uh, on Poland. And therefore, next week in Strasbourg, we will have in front of us the council where publicly they will explain what's going on. And we have asked to have a joint debate between the two issues. So politically, we mark the territory that this cannot be business as usual. And I would like to bring to your attention a third element, because on the initiative of our group, uh, with also the support of other political groups, we have uh, sent a letter to van der Leyen, to the European Commission, asking the European Commission to reject the draft Hungarian plan uh, on the basis of uh, several issues that uh, I'm sure that uh, our rapporteur for the European Parliament, Gwendolina Del Bosco-Caulfield, will explain to us. And of course, this is also a very, very strong instrument because Again, for the first time in the European Parliament, there is a letter, there is a political expression sent to the European Commission to ask them to act and expressly to reject the draft Hungarian plan and uh, to take time to rediscuss and also to correct the political situation. Therefore, the moment that we are discussing is very important and the real question that I would like to put on all of you is not only to speak about the current situation, but also to discuss the strategies for the next steps and how we tactically and politically should act in order to put the right pressure at all levels without from the other side 
penalize the citizens because unfortunately the citizens, they need this recovery resilient plan because all of us during this period, we have suffered and we continue to suffer from the COVID-19 pandem pandemia. Therefore, this is not a luxury. This is a real need in order to create a, a, a recovery in our societies and also in Hungary, in Poland, in other countries. But of course, this cannot be done on the detriment of fundamental rights. And this money have to be canalized in the right perspective, in the right people and not become an extra instrument of Orban to prepare his next elections. So after this short introduction, with a lot of pleasure and honor, I would like to present you the panel. We have Sergei Lee Karaksoni, which is, uh, sorry for the pronunciation, this is not my strong point, which he is the mayor of uh, uh, Budapest, which he will tell us exactly what's going on. We have Margot Zata Trax, uh, our Polish MP and also co-leader of uh, Zieloni. We have uh, uh, Karolis Granikas from the Open Procurement EU. And last but not least, we have our MEP from France, uh, Gwendolina Del Bosque Caulfield, who is uh, beyond all the rest, the official rapporteur of the European Parliament on Hungary. And of course, on the follow-up on Article 7, the famous report of and another Green MEP, Sargentini, who uh, really became an historical figure in, uh, in Hungary. So the floor is yours, uh, Sergei. Uh, so thank you very much for being with us and also for your strategical contribution. Köszönöm szépen én is a lehetőséget, remélem működik a tolmácsolás. Először is egy magyarázattal tartozom, egy kicsit furcsa helyszínen vagyok, ugyanis valóban Magyarországon választásra készülünk, és szociáldemokatai zöld pártok színeiben én is indulok az ellenzéki előválasztáson, és éppen kampányolok vidéken egy barátunk irodájában, húztam meg magam, hogy be tudjak ebbe a beszélgetésbe csatlakozni. A másik, amit előjáróban szeretnék elmondani, hogy remélem itt van a beszélgetésünkben Jávor Benedek, kiváló barátom és pártársam, aki zöldpárti EP képviselő volt, és ma a főváros ö, brüsszeli irodáját vezet, és ma van a születésnapja, úgyhogy ö, nagy szeretettel üdvözlöm Bencét, remélem, hogy itt van és hal minket, ha nem, akkor, ö, akkor is azt gondolom, hogy sok barátja van ebben a beszélgetésben. Komolyra fordítva, mert ezek is komoly dolgok a szót, engedjék meg, hogy tulajdonképpen négy fő állítást tegyek meg ezzel a valóban sok szempontból új és eléggé bonyolult helyzettel kapcsolatosan, amely Magyarország, a magyar helyreállítási terv és az Európai Unió viszonyát illeti. Az egyik az, hogy nagyon fontos, hogy ezt a vitát hogy ezt a vitát mindig úgy kövessük, hogy azt a... Nincs, nincs tolmácsolás. Van valami? Jó, nekem többen írják a csetben, hogy, hogy, van, van, hogy nincs, nincs tolmácsolás, nem tudom akkor mi a probléma, lehet, hogy valami segítséget kell nyújtani a többieknek. Szóval az első dolog, amit arra szeretnék kérni mindenkit, hogy hogy soha ne azonosítsák a magyar kormány politikáját Magyarország egészével. Ez talán triviális és kézenfekvő, de az Orbán kormány mindent megtesz annak érdekében, hogy azok a kritikák, amelyeket a kormányt érintik, azok a jogos európai visszhangok, amelyek sokszor érthetlenül állnak amellett, hogy egy Európai Uniós tagállam kormánya hogyan tud ilyen törvényeket kezdeményezni és elfogadni, ezek sokszor ugyanennek meg a magyar nyilvánosságban a kormánynak az a politikai stratégiája azt akarja elérni, hogy ezeket a támadásokat a nemzet az ország egész elleni támadásaként értelmezzék. És néha az európai kritikák is arról szólnak, a megfogalmazások néha arról szólnak, hogy Magyarországot kell megregulázni, Magyarországot kell megbüntetni. Ezek félre, 
sikerült mondatok, és az egész helyreállítási tervhez való viszonyulás szempontjából is fontos, hogy ne keverjük össze ezt a két dolgot. Tudom, hogy amit mondok, az nagyon kézenfekvő és triviális, de, de mégis azt gondolom, hogy, hogy ez fontos lesz, hogy az elején, mert ebből sok minden következik. A másik, amit, amit mi nagyon fontosnak érzünk a magyarországi zöld és baloldali pártok, amelyek nagyon fontos részét képezik a az ellenzéki egységnek, amelynek egyébként jelenleg is több szavazója, mint a Fidesznek, tehát jó eséllyel, jó eséllyel tudunk nekifutni a következő választásnak. Ez az ellenzéki egység is a közös értékek mellett jött létre, és én azt gondolom, hogy az Európai Unió, ha hosszú távon nem tudja az alapértékek tekintélyét, becsületét megerősíteni, hogyha folyamatosan csak szavak és szavak következnek, és nincsenek tettek, amelyek érvényesítik ezeknek az alapértékeknek az érvényesülését, akkor, akkor ez a közösség meg fog gyengülni. Éppen ezért nem lehet olyan stratégiája az Európai Unió elkötelezett pártjainak és közösségeinek, amely, amely szemet húny és egyfajta kompromisszumot költ olyan dolgokban, amikben nincsenek kompromisszumok. Az Európai Unió egy, 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 egy konszenzus kereső intézmény, de a konszenzus keresés azon alapszik, hogy bizonyos ügyekben nincs kompromisszum. Az Európai Unió az nem egy lobby szervezet, az nem egy részvénytársaság, az Európai Unió nem egy pragmatikus együttműködés. Az Európai Unió elsősorban érték közössége bizonyos nemzeteknek, akik, akik másféleképpen akarnak másféle akarnak politizálni, mint a világ más pontjain teszik ezt. Ez nagyon fontos. Azt gondolom, hogy olyan megoldást találni, ami, ami szemet húny bizonyos alapvető értékek megsértésével szemben, ez hosszú távon ö, ö, semmiképpen nem járható út. A harmadik dolog, amit mondani szeretnék, az, hogy ez a helyreállítási terv, amit a magyar kormány benyújtott, akkor is visszautisításra érdemes, hogyha egyébként Magyarországon minden jogállamisága kapcsolatos elvárás tökéletesen teljesülne. Mert ez a terv, ez egy rossz terv. Nem szolgálja sem Magyarország érdekeit, se nem szolgálja az Európai Unió érdekeit, és azokat a fontos célkitűzéseket, amelyek miatt egyáltalán a helyreállítási alap megnyílt a tagállamok számára. Nagyon hosszasan tudnám ezeket a kritikáimat felsorolni, de, de hagyja melyek ki a tartalmi, a tervvel kapcsolatos kritikámból három elemet. Az egyik az, hogy semmilyen módon nem teljesültek a partnerségi egyeztetéssel kapcsolatos elvárások. Ez azt jelenti, hogy a kormány egy olyan tervet nyújtott be, amelyet tulajdonképpen az utolsó pillanatban átdolgoztak, és senki nem ismerte a benyújtás előtt. Korábban voltak látszott egyeztetések, Például a fővárosi önkormányzat és a kormány között létrejött egy szakmai bizottság, ami egyszer ülésezett, de végül is azt a tervet, amit ténylegesen benyújtottak, azt a tervet senki nem látta. Azt a kormány ugyanis eredetileg egy olyan tervet készített elő, amely a teljes, a hitelkerettel együtt a teljes forrásra igényt tartott volna, miután kiderült, hogy ezt nem fogják tudni azokkal a projektekkel feltölteni, amelyeket szerettek volna, végül is az egészet újra gondolták, és a benyújtott tervet senki nem látta a benyújtás előtt. Ettől még ez lehetne egy fantasztikus terv, de valójában csapnivaló és nagyon gyenge minőségű. Két dolgot emelnék ki tartalmi szempontból. Az egyik az, hogy a zöld átmenet kapcsán tulajdonképpen egy, egy rendkívül szakmaiatlan programot akar a kormány véghez vinni, mégpedig az, hogy a magyar épületállománynak a fűtését elektromos áramra helyezze át, és ehhez bővítsen megújuló energiakapacitásokat, ami egy olyan országban, amely Európában a legrosszabbul teljesít az energiahatékonyság szempontjából, nyilvánvalóan egy teljesen értelmetlen beruházás. Egy fokkal talán jobb, hogyha a magyar lakások mondjuk az orosz gáz helyett megújuló energiával fűtik az utcát, de talán jobb lenne, hogyha nem az utcát fűtenék, hanem növelnék a hatékonyságot. Ez az egyik példám. A másik példám pedig az, hogy a bizottság által elkészített országajánlás, 
amely arról szól, hogy, hogy mit javasol a bizottságnak megfontolás tárgyává tenni, hogy milyen programokat valósítson meg az RFF-ből. Egy konkrét javaslata van a magyar kormány felé, ez pedig az, hogy a, az Európában legszűkmarkúbb álláskeresési támogatási rendszert bővítsék ezekből a forrásokból. A magyar kormány büszke rá, hogy nem hajlandó ezeket bővíteni, mert abban bízik, hogy a gazdaság gyorsan taplál, és a eltűnt munkahelyeket a gazdasági növekedés pótolni fogja. Ez nyilvánvalóan nem így lesz, és rengeteg szenvedést fog jelenteni a magyar polgárok számára is ez. Tehát ez egy rossz terv, amit akkor is vissza kéne utasítani, hogyha Magyarországon a jogállamiság minden szempontból kiválóan működne, de tudjuk azt, hogy ez nem így van, és ezért a negyedik és egyben legfontosabb dolog, amit mondani szeretnék. Az Európai Unió a terv kapcsán végre érvényesítheti a jogállamisággal kapcsolatos kritériumoknak egy nagyon-nagyon fontos szeletét. Ez pedig az antikorrupciós garanciák. Magyar ellenzéki politikusként az a tapasztalatom, hogyha a magyar kormány vitát kell, hogy kiváltson az Európai Unióval a jogállamisági kritériumok kapcsán, akkor ez a vita a magyar belpolitikában általában mondjuk úgy sportos hasonlattal ez ilyen nagyjából döntetlenre jön ki. Tehát sok választópolgára lehet tudják fogadtatni azt, hogy Magyarországon is demokrácia van, csak egy kicsit másmilyen. Persze mi tudjuk, hogy ez hazugság. De azt az elemet, hogy az Európai Uniós pénzeket Magyarországon gyakorlatilag jelentős mértékben ellopják, olyan gazdasági klientúrát építenek, amely torzítja a versenyt, elképesztő magánvagyonokat hoz létre, és gyakorlatilag az Európai Unió forrásaiból finanszírozzuk Európa legeurópa ellenesebb kormányát, a magyar kormányt, ezt mindenki tudja Magyarországon, még a fideszesek sem nagyon tudnak ezzel ellen igazából védekezni. Ezért azt gondolom, hogy itt az ideje, hogy komoly, valódi, konkrét kritériumokat határozzon meg az Európai Bizottság, az Európai Tanács, az Európai Intézmények a Magyar Helytársi Terv kapcsán a magyar jogállamiságot illetően, de ebben azt gondolom, hogy a legélesebb kést az antikorrupciós garanciák kellenek, hogy jelentség. Mert ezek megfoghatóak, itt nem lehet politikailag mellé beszélni, és ezt a magyar választók is pontosan tudják, hogy a konfliktus egy része az arról szól, hogy az Európai Unió nem akarja, hogy az Európai Uniós adófizetők pénzét Magyarországon ellopják. Éppen ezért én azt javaslom, hogy az legyen a stratégiája a, a, az Európai Uniónak a magyar kormánya kapcsolatos vitáiban, hogy sokkal markánsabban és egyértelműbben felhánytolgatja az antikorrupciós garanciák hiányát. Ez egy teljesen jogos igény. Ez egy magyar és európai érdek egyaránt, és ez higgyék el, nagyon fájni fog a magyar kormánynak. Természetesen nagyon fontos, hogy az összes többi ügyben a szexuális kisebbségeket megbélyegző törvény kapcsán, és általában más emberi jogi vagy alapértékek kapcsán az Európai Unió hallassa a hangját, és ezeket folyamatosan tegye kritika tárgyává, és reméljük, hogy a az Európai Bíróság hamarosan dönteni fog ezekben az ügyekben, és akkor lesz egy a politikai vitán felülálló egyértelmű jelzés arról, hogy hogyan is állunk Magyarországon az alapértékek témájában, de a helyreállítási terv kapcsán nulla, azaz nulla kompromisszumot javaslok az antikorrupciós garanciákat illetően. Ez egy olyan vita, amit, amit a magyar ellenzék is meg tud nyerni itthon, és, és nem teszi lehető, hogy Orbán Vítor úgy állítsa be azt a vitát, amelyeket, amelyet folytat az Európai Unióval, hogy jó a nemzeti érdekeket védi az Európai Unióval szemben. Az, nemzet, nem, de, az nem nemzeti érdek, hogy Orbán Viktor oligarchái tovább gazdagodjanak. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Gergely, for uh, your first uh, strategical uh, contributions. Uh, I think that it will be part of uh, our uh, debate uh, later. Um, I would like just to give uh, the floor to uh, Malgor Zata, so also briefly she can uh, explain to us uh, what's the situation uh, with uh, Poland and uh, uh, we just uh, uh, also how do you see the next steps 
uh, also link to the general debate on the rule of law. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I'm very glad I can participate in this uh, debate about extremely important topic from our Polish point of view. Uh, as you probably know, the human rights and also rule of law, they are real pro problems in Poland uh, with our current government. Yeah, it's over six years when also European Union noticed many uh, bad things happening in Poland with changes of the judiciary system. Uh, I was thinking about this debate to um, tell a little bit about how Polish uh, RRP was created and what, where we see the dangers in terms of rule of law or corruption from the Polish perspective, and maybe give some solutions that I saw that uh, they are already in some green documents. Uh, so basically the Polish national plan, recovery plan, was just like a tool used by uh, the ruling party to play with the opposition. It was like a huge political issue because the left decided to collaborate with the government on the national plan behind the back of the other opposition parties. Uh, and that's why uh, we think also everything was done in a rush. And they are not enough. I'm, I, I won't talk about uh, climate issues or, or gender balance because, of course, it's not clear in the Polish national plan, but it's not the topic of the debate. However, the whole process of working on the Polish national plan was very disturbing uh, because from the political, because of the political reasons, the government sent uh, to the commission um, the draft of, uh, of the national plan without waiting for the opinion of the local and regional authorities and also civic society. There was one phase of the negotiation and some changes were implemented by the government, but then there was the second wave and the government just didn't wait yeah, for, the, for the voice of local um, and regional authorities. So it was extremely disturbing. Uh, we also, as you know, as the opposition have no trust in our government, we already see that they want to use the, the recovery plan for their own election um, purposes, they already announced a new deal for Poland. And of course, some of the funds will be the European funds for it. And then we have several issues that in the, we think that there's not enough protection in terms of rule of law um, guaranteed by the, from the side of the European Commission and also from the Polish side itself. Uh, we are afraid that most of the money will go in not transparent way uh, to the state uh, govern um, enterprises, especially the ones that uh, deal with fossil fuels. So they might, there's a danger there be no uh, enough money for the local um, initiatives uh, or for the small companies that should be like the beneficiaries of the, of the European fund. Uh, we also see that there's no um, reforms about the judiciary system in the Polish national plan, probably because the Poland, yeah, Polish government already did all the bad things in terms of uh, judiciary. And even if they have planned to do more, they cannot admit it uh, right now in front of the commission. So that's kind of lack of it. Uh, we also have like a bad experience because we had something what was called like local initiatives found uh, that was the money from the government to the local and regional authorities. But um, it seems that the grant, the money went only to the local and regional authorities that cooperate with the Polish government. So for example, to the mayors of the cities that announce themselves as LGBT free zones, uh, or they support the government. And the cities ruled by the mayors from the opposition, they got like zero money from this national, um, from this local initiative national fund. And we are afraid it might be similar situation when it comes to European money from recovery and resilience uh, facility, that uh, it won't be um, equal, yeah? that only some of the companies will get the money 
and some of the local authorities will get the money. So it won't be fair uh, in terms of Polish uh, citizens because everyone needs uh, this this huge support yeah that that will that the fund will uh, will provide uh, so let's say they are like the main issues and we think how to change it because uh, in the polish national plan we don't have the major role of monitoring committee the monitoring committee that it is in the plan is basically controlled by the government and the representation of of the local authorities or the or the civic society uh, is not good enough so we don't have this tool to control the spendings we as a greens we applied for like a proper list public list of the companies or all the benefit recipients of the money yeah? so let's make it public and transparent but we don't know if the polish government will do this uh, then another thing is with the european public prosecutors uh, we know that that's the tool european tool the european institution that will take care of of how the money is spending however poland and hungary they didn't join to the european public public prosecutor's office so we lose this tool as well the tools we still have i think it's mostly the european anti-fraud office and we really would like to strengthen this office with money, with um, finances, so there'll be more people working on, it, on this and check how the national plans are being proceed um, during the, the, the whole implementation. And the second, uh, the second tool, they are these milest milestones. We know that the uh, our, our RPs are based on milestones, and then the European Commission has the power to say, like for example, six months uh, to build the factory of cars. You did uh, electric cars. You did nothing towards it, so we stop finance financing or cut financing because you're not following the milestones. So we see that would be the tool but we still afraid it might be not enough and uh, now i go back to like article 7 uh, because i think it's a powerful tool in hands of the european commission uh, the, the the case poland and article 7 we we observe all of it uh, since 2017 uh, i know that in the july there will be like a new report of the european commission on rule of law in poland the reports that we have each year yeah so that would be also like a tool um, given to the commission to do something um, with the with the article 7 and then we have regulation on protection of the union budget from uh, 2020 and also that was poland that filed the complaint to the to the European Court of Justice uh, about this uh, about this regulation and we know that the Commission doesn't have to wait for um, for the decision of the European Court of Justice but can make independent decisions when it comes to the conditionality yeah, of, of the uh, of the European funds given to the member states. So I think in this situation, of course, we, we as Greens, we want this money for Polish citizens. We need it, yeah, because we see uh, the lack of money if, uh, if the healthcare uh, in the climate agenda, uh, in digital agenda. And uh, it, but we, we also know that this European money should support Polish citizens, no matter what gender they are, uh, what religion they have or they don't have, what uh, nationality they, uh, they are, yeah, if they live in Poland, they should have the equal right to use these funds. And right now we see many, many dangers that the Polish national plan will not allow it and the Polish government will use this money just for their own election purposes and will divide the Polish society for the ones that support the government and will get the financial support and the ones that are against the government and will have no money from, from this huge uh, European tool. So I hope that we as Greens will, will use these possibilities and also the European Commission will be bold enough to use the tools that they have in terms of rule of law to, to support Polish citizens. 
Thank you very much, Margorjata, but also uh, not only for the analysis, but also for the pieces that you give us for the, 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 the possible options you give us for the follow-up. But again, we will come as part of the discussion on, uh, on following up your points. Uh, so now I would like to give uh, Karolis uh, to you the floor. Thank you very much. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Karolis. I'm, I'm connecting today from uh, Vilnius. Um, my home country and I work for the organization called Open Contracting Partnership, uh, which is, we call ourselves a global silo busting collaboration between governments, businesses and non-governmental stakeholders to transform procurement and public contracting using open government principles. So I lead our work in the European Union and I'm, I'm, I'm mostly interested in how to use data, technology, stakeholder engagements, openness, open government principles to transform public spending. Uh, I'll speak about uh, a pan-European perspective today very briefly, not touching specifically on, on too many countries, but, but giving you an overview of on the take of transparency of RRF plans. That's my job today. So you might not be surprised that during the pandemic, uh, we had as an organization, a lot of work. You heard so many challenges of procurement of public spending and mismanagement and, and the old challenges of the slow risk averse corruption prone systems of procurement or public spending just got even worse. And we witnessed um, that we cannot really afford bad, bad uh, procurement, uh, which is, remember, about 15% of our global, uh, of our annual GDP, which is number one corruption risk across the board in the European Union, and which costs about 5 billion euros on an annual basis in loss for corruption in the overall sector. So uh, we thought, of course, that with the attention that procurement got during the pandemic, especially after having seen multiple trust crises in the European Union ahead of the pandemic, including the populist trials, the Brexit and everything, and, and, and also having the first ever joint borrowing and spending exercise in the shape of RRF, well, one might think that the European Commission actually has a great plan together with member states to be extra serious in designing the plans in a way that would ensure that we build back the trust of the Europeans in the European project. And I don't have to tell you about the green transition and the magnitude of the objective that that is in, in those plans. And, um, uh, you know, and, 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 and the head of Olaf also just recently, a couple of weeks ago, uh, stepped out into the global press in the Financial Times. And he said that he's concerned that the EU faces big risk of abuses in the use of these funds because not all member states are planning to report beneficiaries to the EU via entirely voluntary system, which is called ARACNE. Um, Let's not forget that according to the recent survey of Transparency International, more than half of the Europeans think that their government is run by private interests. And these beliefs are precisely uh, fueling support for populist anti-democratic forces. So at the newly found Open Procurement EU coalition, which is a uh, collaboration between uh, non-governmental stakeholders working in open procurement field, uh, we looked at the RRF regulation and 22 national plans that were available back in, in, in May. And despite all of these concerns, uh, the European Commission, first of all, and we knew that does not really require a publication of any, any information to do with the implementation of RRF plans. And uh, that is not going to be compensated by transparency at the national level too. And the analysis that we did, we actually went through all the plans and we found out that uh, 20 out of 22 countries, responding to what Malgojata just said, are not going to publish information about final beneficiaries of their of RRF spending, 20 out of 22. Uh, at best, we found weak and general language about publishing information on how the money is used with scarcely any details about what will be made public, how, when, and, and where. And just one country, Sweden, as a matter of fact, promises to publish audit reports and reporting back to the commission. Now, six countries did not commit to any transparency requirements, including a principle of openness and transparency and proactive publication. And those include Austria, Croatia, Denmark, Germany, 
Poland, and Slovakia. And those six countries. Now, remember a few months back, Emmanuel Macron said all stimulus packages should be available in open data so that citizens can follow the money. Quote. Now, you know how many plants have open data provision out of 22? Zero. Not even a single plan has open data provision in their in their text, right? I have been following, you know, Merkel, Emmanuel Macron, Thierry Breton coming out with the same high level political statement. On the implementation level, zero. Now, the lack of transparency here at this stage seriously impedes, of course, the work of organizations such as ours and the coalition such as ours, anti-corruption groups, investigative journalists. If even the commission and all of don't have proper oversight, then of course we are, we are going for a failure. And without reliable public information, it will be very hard to convince an increasingly cynical public in, in the EU that interventions have been a success, that the EU is really building back better. So we, of course, started speaking with the commission and the member states about it. And, and there are good news. I, I managed to speak with my own uh, government and, and the finance ministry said that we, are, we will implement five out of six your specific recommendations. Great, fantastic. I have got rejected a meeting with DG Recover this morning with the coalition uh, trying to sort of propose our recommendations to them. So we clearly need a bit more political gravitas there uh, so that Recover can actually uh, did you, I mean, the task force on, on recover can actually help member states to integrate these transparency uh, requirements, which we have very specific wording suggestions uh, for. Um, and, and with Lithuania, by the way, there's no surprise. I mean, this was number one country in COVID-19 transparency and, and the way they managed the crisis with the information management systems. And generally, we found that countries with better data and better technology dealt with COVID-19 uh, a bit better. The good news, you might argue, uh, being an optimistic I am, is that there is time to change this still. There is time to still strengthen the plans, uh, working together with the Commission, but they have to get their act together and incorporate serious and specific commitments to transparency and accountability in their RRF uh, uh, plans. I know for a fact uh, that we have a very strong capacity across the, the board in many, many EU countries to actually contribute to watching the integrity of RRF spending, non-governmental uh, watchdog, and I mean, and there is no way to utilize that if we don't design the RRF plans in a way that would allow us to do this. So I will stop here and I, I, I honestly hope to have a follow-up discussion with you to understand how we can help task force and the member states to have a conversation of very specific uh, wordings in their uh, plans and specific commitments, which we are happy to discuss with you. So thank you so much for your time today. I hope this, this is useful. Yes, hello everyone, thank you. Um, sadly, I didn't hear um, Gregory in English, so I hope I will not repeat certain things that he said, but anyway, um, I just wanted to put things in context about Hungary, for example. Of course, um, we hear a lot about the attacks against fundamental rights and um, the rule of law in, in, in the independence of justice, the pluralism of media, all of these very, very important questions, uh, issues that mean that a state is in democracy and a healthy democracy. But uh, in fact, um, one of the worst uh, um, problems, uh, and it's a democratic problem of Hungary today, is the misuse of the public money. Um, and it's even uh, sadder that the fact that he can, that Viktor Orban and his people can grab the power as much as they do and they can grab all the media um, um, opportunities and can silence a lot of people and can uh, uh, establish in, in all sorts of places in Hungary a very tight power. This has been possible because of European money for years. They have misused European money for their own profit and the profit of a few oligarchs and that's what made him put up this state. And what is really annoying is when you go to other member states and tell them they should act and they answer to you, well, why don't the Hungarian people act? I mean, this is, these people, they should complain about their, um, their, their leader. 
and they should complain about the attacks on their country and maybe they choose to be where they are and you have to say again that in fact some of these people half of the population today has not a choice and they are not represented and you have democratic problems because we let Orban and his people use the European money as he did to install his complete power. Uh, and this is, of course, something that we can see in other member states in, a, in sometimes a slighter way or, or, or sti still starting to spread, but it is also. That is why it is more and more important that we be serious on this European money and why this very um, new money coming with the recovery plan was under great scrutiny from our groups in parliament, most of all the, the Green Group, but to be honest, a lot of groups are worried about this money. And this is also why you have more and more scrutiny coming from some member states, the famous Google ones, the ones that are not that happy to put money in the European big basket, and they're even less happy when they think that this money is misused. So in this coalition between the parliament and these Google countries, that are also very, very aware of the uh, of the importance of rule of law, and most of the time they are the ones that work the most on this. We can we can hope to make things move. Uh, we started to have scrutiny on this LFF money uh, since the beginning. Uh, it's a very general uh, scrutiny. Uh, the Green Group has looked at all of the plans that has been said. But of course, there was a special scrutiny on the Hungarian one. And we do hope to go also for a bigger scrutiny on the Polish one. Um, since it, there was a first letter sent by uh, Greens uh, uh, a month ago. This letter was because they had been uh, press releases and, and information in Hungary from the government himself saying that most of the, uh, a big part of the money would go to university. And what has happened uh, at the start of this year is that the Hungarian government changed the organizational structures of the university. There are no more state public uh, services they are now under a very specific system, a trust system, which makes their money uh, opaque, the way they use their money opaque, and which also puts foundations at the leadership of these university foundations that are friends for Orban. So we sent this first letter. Did it have an effect or not? Anyway, the Hungarian government didn't put university in their plan. So that was a first win. And now we did a second letter we got on board with uh, other groups on this. Only the EPP didn't sign in the end, but they participated in the work before. Um, and we sent a letter to, indeed, you talked about it, Bula, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, to the Commission to say that we wanted a very serious scrutiny of this Hungarian plan. Um, the fact that uh, these trusts, once again, these, these all new structural organization that the Hungarian government has created for a number of public services, so would we have the choice where the money would go when it went to these sort of places? Of course, the question of the independence of judiciary, the question of the consultation. There was no consultation in the Hungarian um, uh, with the Hungarian plan, n not sufficient uh, consultation. And then we did also, of course, make a, a, a reference to the, the, the fundamental rights and the rule of law, because there's some money that is planned to go to education. And we said that, of course, with these new awful laws on LGBTI people, this would be also a misuse of European money on the founding of, of, of uh, human rights. Um, so that's it. Um, we hope that this will be seriously made. We also know that the Commission needs a push. They need a symbolic push because if not, they don't act. And we are in a very nice momentum at the moment where all um, People are looking to Hungary and to what is happening, and so we hope that the Commission will, will act better. But we also know that the Commission often needs input, very legal, clear input. It seems a bit crazy, but in fact, the Commission doesn't have that much resources to work, and they often come back to us, Parliament, saying, what, where would you go? What's, what's your angle of attack? So we are trying as a Green Group, but in alliance with the other groups in the Parliament, to show more and more the very specific points they should be looking at on a very technical point. We have very good advisors working in the Green Group that help us on that. Um, and then this work could be, of course, a, a grounding work for the West, because all the money that the European uh, 
uh, uh, European Union gives to the member states should now be also under this scrutiny. This is the goal, of course, of this famous rule of law conditionality, which is not yet put in place. Uh, it has been voted, but now we need it to put in place because that would be the idea to have exactly the same seriousness and scrutiny in all the money that goes to the member states. And then just to finish, of course, Hungary is a very specific um, problem. Uh, and there's a, such a dismantle and such a misuse of money that has been stated by Olaf, the anti -fraud, European Anti-Fraud Office, uh, Carol has talked about, and stated by others, the Com Venice Commission and all sorts of structures that have showed the level of corruption in Hungary. So this is a very specific angle, but to be honest, we need to be serious with all countries. We are not talking today, for example, of all these countries where you have golden visa and money that go to state in a very, very awkward and um, um, uh, blind way. And we don't know how Malta, Cyprus, Cyprus and the others use the money they get from the golden visa. So there would be a lot to be done also on other member states. Um, so once again, the very seriousness of this is also the, the, the trust of all of us in a common future and the fact that everyone feels attached to the European uh, destiny because what we what could be the threat is that more and more if the Nordic country, Netherlands and some others find that the money, European money is not clearly well used, they will be more and more reluctant to participate in this the all these recovery uh, processes. So it is at stake that we really be serious on this. I remember years ago when uh, we had uh, Benedict uh, Yavor in the group, uh, he was really uh, very eloquent and uh, repeatedly that the corruption is not a byproduct, uh, but is the essence of Orban's uh, government. And uh, to be honest, when he was doing this reference that uh, uh, Orban is the real corruption and it is this corruption is also uh, very much linked with a lack of respect and also lack to the fundamental rights. Uh, we were just, uh, mm, let's say, looking at him because it was not so clear that uh, after all these years, finally, he's absolutely right because the two things very often they go together. And uh, I believe that this is uh, also a golden opportunity uh, exactly because there is a different way of building this recovery, a resilient pound, because we have the grants, we have the loans, we have the responsibility, the core responsibility of the member states to participate to the reconstruction and the recovery of our societies, that indeed, if this money is not spent correctly, there is an extra reason really to, uh, uh, to, 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 to fight politically, because that creates a, a new dynamic in, in, in the society because still, uh, let's say, the, the discrepancies between the population are increasing and the corruption is not helping at all on that. Uh, but the question to you, uh, Sergey, is um, I would like to uh, just come back in, uh, in uh, an activity on an initiative you took some time ago on this pact of free cities alliance where you remember you together with uh, the mayor of uh, Warsaw, of uh, Prague, of Bratislava, you made an appeal saying that because we have this government, uh, we really would like to, uh, um, we would like to, to have a direct finance to the cities uh, in order also not to uh, penalize the population. So I would like to know uh, if this uh, initiative you took, uh, where you stand with that, uh, if this is something that you are still uh, pushing politically, uh, because of course this is uh, uh, not a different way of approaching the problem because we have a very real problem and we need to reject the plan and to put pressure, but at the same moment uh, we have also to open other ways for a direct financing on cities, on, authority, uh, uh, on local authorities, which can somehow help the citizens directly without necessarily helping the governments. Sergei, the floor is yours. 
if I have been clear enough. <laughs> if not, I will repeat. <laughs> Köszönöm szépen, ez egy nagyon fontos kérdés, és valóban időszerűvé is válik. Amikor azt keressük, hogy hogyan szankcionáljunk kormányt. When we try how to understand how to sanction a government in order not to punish the entire state or the population, we uh, thought that it was correct to request directly the financing from the European Union fund us directly, not the governments. So first of all, we got a coalition for cities, uh, the four of Visegrad, and then we made our proposal to the European Union. Finally, we were 26 cities. We didn't uh, get to many replies. We didn't uh, achieve many results. We didn't achieve many reforms within uh, the European institutions. However, we uh, selected uh, a um, orientation for the future. I think that this proposal is positive. Then we have also the partnership uh, strengthened principle in uh, the RRF, uh, which is another very positive instrument. Certainly, we uh, would need a collaboration among municipalities, between municipalities and local governments. So we spoke a lot about it with our Polish uh, colleagues, uh, with the uh, Polish uh, mayors. I believe that in Poland, there is quite uh, an opening towards collaboration. Then I don't know whether on a daily basis is implemented or not. In Hungary, this is not the case. In Italy, we didn't receive uh, not even a euro, one euro of uh, funding or resources uh, from the government. However, you understand that political change, uh, that climate change is a green policy starts from uh, big cities. Uh, going back to corruption, I would like to say that uh, every big city in Hungary and in the four Visegrad uh, countries in Europe uh, share the principles of the European Union with regard to the fight against corruption. We are here, we are ready. We are ready to use these resources if um, we'll uh, uh, be given this financing. But now everything goes through the government, and then the centralization allows corruption to be spread out, to spread out, and uh, we don't get any financing. So, if there is such a strong centralization, then it is difficult to help uh, using these resources. So, channels are closed. So this uh, lobbying work, uh, well, is supported by us. We believe that it is extremely important. However, we have not reached any uh, system result so far. Thank you. Indeed, uh, it is not uh, part of the regulation, and it is a very small part, maybe, of the uh, of the different of all the different funds that they go directly to the cities. And this is something that we have obviously to continue to support. Uh, and we are working also very closely with the Committee of the Regions, but also with mayors, with Eurocities, with a lot of organizations which they can uh, really uh, help us to go to this, uh, to this direction. Gwendolina, I have a question uh, from you, from Monica Frassoni, uh, which is asking uh, if you can explain to us the reactions of the Commission, the European Commission, on the letter we have sent, and uh, if uh, uh, there are some substantial, let's say, changes or wishes of the Commission to take seriously our uh, demands uh, and, the, and the research and the analysis we have produced. Well, of course, with Commission, it's um, uh, we never get official info we get under um, uh, under the table information For, first thing is already to say that they had already planned to um, to be a bit more harsh on the Hungarian plan than others we know that power Lord Gentiloni um, has asked them to go to to really uh, go through all the info through this Arachne uh, uh, system, which is a system that checks if, if everything is uh, 
is 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 fine uh, on uh, public procurement and all of this. And if the info are there, we we also know that they really uh, are pushing the Hungarian government to be as uh, uh, give as much information as it possible. And then we have been told that since they received our letter, they are very happy uh, that they will go uh, through all the details that we asked. Um, and we've also been told that they would like us to do basically the same letter about the Polish situation. Um, so I know that uh, Zita, our advisor, is is in link with with the Polish Greens and and others to see how we can work on this. Um, so the idea would be to do basically the same model of uh, the uh, uh, signatures from uh, most of the groups here. Uh, Birch signatures and Libe signatures, so people working more on rule of law aspects and people working more on the budget and control aspects uh, to, to do the same sort of letter on Poland uh, to put there again a bit more pressure. So the reaction of the commission is good. Uh, basically, every time the reaction of the commission is good, I, I, I just make a link on something which is the the question of the state aids for media, which has been a very important issue in, in Hungary. And Benedek, who works with Gregory, um, did at the time where he was an MEP, did a first complaint about this. It has been followed up a few times since then. And when we talk to um, Vestager and the commission, they always say, please, we want to follow up on this, but give us even more info and go into more details and all of this. So it's a bit annoying because sometimes we have the feeling that we are uh, subcontracting the work of the commission, but it's it's very rare that we have um, a negative um, a negative uh, response from the commission, but most of the time they really want us to put up all the work. Um, when I think that uh, in addition, uh, Monica have asked also uh, what it was the answer of the Commission in the first letter, in the general one, and not only in the Hungarian, uh, because we have sent two letters. The first one was public. Oh yeah, the one on all the plans. Um, yes. I'm yes. sorry, Vula, do you know that? Because that was, a, I, I, I'm a, I, honest, must, I don't know what was, I mean, I, I think that... Um, um, no, no uh, we just... Uh, yeah, go uh, on. Yes, Ernest is with us. Uh, maybe, okay. Ernest, if you are connected, then uh, you can uh, just uh, jump in. Yes, I am here. Uh, what was what, what was the, 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 the question, Hula, that, that yes, you wanted to ask? The, the reactions of the Commission uh, to the first letter regarding yeah. the plans. Well, I have to tell you that the the commission was it took very seriously the 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 letter that we sent. That's for sure. Uh, and actually, I have to tell you that with the first letter, we managed uh, to make uh, several changes uh, in some of the plans. I can make you one example. For instance, there was a um, um, uh, a high uh, connect electrical connection uh, through a Natura 2000 area in Spain that was in the national plan. Uh, that, uh, well, when we sent the first le letter, it, uh, the, the Spanish plan was under the revision and that project was taken away. Huh? So, I, and, th and that happened also in two or, or three other projects that we identified. So in some uh, issues, the commission is really willing to engage with us. So I can tell you, well, of course, in some other areas, the, re the, 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 the reactions that we got were, were too broad and very general. But I, ha I have the impression that while we didn't manage to have legal powers uh, for the parliament, in the evaluation of the recovery plans, because this, this we did not manage to have when we did negotiated the resolution, uh, the regulation, sorry. The commission, of course, politically is obliged to take into account the views of the parliament. So I think this work of uh, scrutinizing, we should continue doing. And I'm sure that now that we, you, we have sent this letter on the Hungarian plan, I am sure politically it will have a weight and it will have an impact. So this is a work that we have to continue doing for sure. And the commission uh, will have to listen to our views and it will it has done it in the past and it will continue doing for sure thank you very much um maybe then i turn to malgorzata because uh, um i mean uh, you explain a little bit the situation and also all the issues around uh, the article 7 we are looking very carefully the report that the commission will uh, with with which will come back uh, and come up uh, very soon uh, could you tell us a little bit about the public opinion and also about uh, the 
alliances uh, when it comes to this attitude of the government? Do you think that there is a real mobilization of the um, opposition parties, but also of the public opinion when it comes to this uh, attitude, when it comes to the recovery and resilient plan? united like in the Hungary right uh, right now uh, sometimes there's lack of a cooperation on the opposition we of course working on it and as a greens we're trying to be like a bridge yeah for different political parties uh, we hope it will be possible to unite opposition but exactly the Polish national plan was, was this tool that divided the Polish opposition so since uh, it, it happened in April, yeah, and it was like a huge media storm and it divided uh, public op opinion that the people that believed in the united opposition, they stopped believing in it after what happened in April. And there was like a public fight, let's say, in social media, in media uh, between um, opposition parties. Of course, we as the Greens, we were on any side, yeah. Um, however, many parties in the opposition felt um, betrayed by the left, that the left behind the back went to talk uh, to the go with the government, yeah, instead of having like a uh, same position of the rest of the opposition and also the, the local and uh, regional authorities. So we're still trying to rebuild the links about it. No, but after what happened in April, of course, the left uh, claims that everything with the Polish national plan is perfect, yeah, because they added few things that uh, that were added to this plan. But basically, the government wanted to make changes before started talking to the left, yeah, and. We know that the changes are extremely superficial. For example, building new houses, of course we want to build, but they put it into the climate priority, yeah, which we know it's not true. So general public opinion about the recovery and resilience found is very positive. Yeah, Like Polish citizens want this money, but the voters of the opposition are upset about the attitude and they also divide it. Yeah? Some of them support the coalition uh, that is criticizing the Polish national plan and some of them supporting the left. So we're working on it. We see what will happen. A lot of political changes on uh, in the Polish political scene in upcoming days or probably even, even tomorrow. Uh, so we're carefully watching, but it doesn't mean that we as the Greens don't play an important role in it. Um, actually, our uh, member of parliament, Ursula Zielinska, in cooperation with the Hungarian Greens, uh, prepared the letter, the call to European Commission about the rule of law in the referring to the Polish national plan. So we're having uh, working on the final draft right now. But basically, we would ask the European Commission and Polish and Hungarian Greens to take into the serious consideration the issue of rule of law in both countries, uh, the, the good of all the citizens, um, the, of course also investigate the powers of European institution, institutions uh, to follow the rule of law in Poland. So um, that would be our, let's say, unique action as a, as a Polish and Hungarian Greens. Um, I hope that it would be uh, it would be efficient and it would be this another voice yeah, that supports also the Greens in the European Parliament uh, asking European Commission uh, to 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 check the rule of law in terms of the of the budget and in responsibility for the future of the EU and the budget of the EU. Thank you very much, uh, Carolis. I would, Carolis, no, Car Carolis. I would like just uh, uh, to take uh, your offer uh, to uh, uh, cooperate more closely with you. Uh, we have a working group uh, in the European Parliament composed with uh, several members that uh, this afternoon are present with us. Uh, we will uh, get in touch with you uh, because obviously the information you gave us is uh, 
extremely relevant and important and shows also that the problem is more general and not all, only focusing in a few countries. It is one thing to complain on the partnership relation. I mean, how much the government consulted the different partners before the plans are uh, published and accepted, uh, because we know that this principle of partenariat was optional and it was an not an obligation, but while in the regulations there are other instruments where clearly they are asking for transparency uh, and, uh, and this is something that we have uh, to follow the regulations à la lettre in order to make sure that there is a serious follow-up. Um, I would like also to remind all of you that uh, we have exactly this working group in the European Parliament, but also in the European Green Party, where permanently we are uh, waiting for uh, specific problems that you can uh, uh, send us, specific informations that we uh, can get in order to make the political follow-up in the European Parliament, because there is also a formal working group under the budget and econ committee, which they follow monthly uh, the monitoring of the plans. So we should not really lose hope because we are uh, in a process where we will have a permanent follow up. I think that it was Malgorzata, which she mentions the milestones, but also there will be a lot of other moments where the European Parliament has a very important role to play. But I would like also to invite you and to close our session with a, uh, with a voice of hope that uh, we really believe that what happening these uh, last uh, weeks and uh, days with uh, uh, this uh, raising of attention on uh, Orban's plans, but also what happening in the European Parliament with some movements of uh, extreme right groups trying to put themselves together and, uh, and uh, anti-Europeans, but, but also very extreme right uh, groups, that this will reinforce, let's say, the more progressive part of the European Parliament and of the European Union to face seriously these problems, uh, because that becomes a threat for the democracy, not only for some member states, but for all over Europe, and as Gwen mentioned, for the European project. And uh, therefore, uh, I am sure that we will be able to continue that. I thank you very, very much for the participation. Hoping to see you soon, and I pass back the floor to Ernest to present the second panel. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vula, for that, and thanks to all the speakers uh, for this uh, interesting first panel. Uh, we are right on time, so we are going to move now to uh, our second panel. Uh, I don't know if uh, Damian is already with us. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Mike Okay, Damian, thank you so much. Damian is now coordinating the, um, the, the, work, the work of the different MEPs in the Green Group uh, working on the RRF, uh, and he will be driving us to the second panel. So, Damian, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you a lot, Ernest, for handing over the floor. And maybe just as a quick word of introduction, as I said, I'm currently coordinating our scrutiny work on the European Parliament from the Greens EFA side when it comes to the Recovery and Resilience Facility. And, and with the NEST together, we actually had a quite an intense time before Christmas uh, negotiating also the recovery and resilience uh, facility from the budget and econ committees together. So this was a very intense time. So everybody can hear me also, Rosella, uh, you can hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, sounds good. So uh, what I was just saying in the beginning is that um, with NS together, I was uh, negotiating the um, recovery and resilience facility until Christmas, which was quite an intense time. And I think we managed to get quite a lot of uh, green points in. I'll mention that in a second. Um, and now I'm currently uh, organizing the scrutiny work of the Greens EFA um, when it comes to all the recovery and resilience plans as well. But uh, this is not about me. I'm very happy to have uh, very good speakers today, good panelists to speak about the, the green dimension. As an introduction, I mean, from our side, what we uh, tried to do in the um, when we were negotiating the recovery resilience facility was to you know, fight very hard for a high climate spending share, but especially also for the methodology that would allow for 
tracking the green spending. And so this was really a focus of our negotiation strategy to try and ensure that we don't have greenwashing, but an actually strong tracking methodology for all the green spending. The second thing that we try to fight for um, on the green dimension is definitely the whole question of biodiversity, where we actually didn't get as much as we wanted. In the beginning, we wanted to have a spending share also on biodiversity, or at least uh, some form of a tracking methodology. But here, the, there was no majority, uh, neither in Parliament nor uh, actually in the Commission or the um, Council when it comes to this. And then Obviously, the third and very important element was the whole question of the do no significant harm principle, where we try to ensure that uh, none of the uh, euros spent under the recovery and resilience facility actually harms our environment. After the negotiations were done, um, we put a lot of effort in trying to understand what the member states are doing. And I want to thank all the um, NGOs also that helped us to, to be strong in our scrutiny of the, of the national recovery and resilience plans uh, to, to check basically for all of these points. I can tell you that in the submitted plans, we saw quite a big danger of greenwashing. Um, and then later on, uh, we also wrote a letter because of that, I think three weeks ago to the commission president, uh, trying to make her aware of the issues that we see. Um, and after that, we saw that in the approved uh, recovery and resilience plans, we have uh, some of the worst project actually taken out and some of the worst fears of uh, greenwashing also countered. For example, I mean, I can give you just one concrete example in Italy, there was this, or is this huge uh, money going into an eco bonus, basically supporting you in renovations for green spending. Um, and we saw that uh, this was uh, yeah, made more precisely uh, to actually, you know, counter greenwashing by ensuring that, um, yeah, you have to have minus 30% reduction in primary energy usage in these renovations. So you can see that the, the commission really tried to improve on that. But our work is still ongoing. And so we are very interested to also hear your thoughts on what the biggest fears are when it come, or, and biggest opportunities are when it comes to, to climate. And um, uh, therefore, I'm very happy to uh, have you all here. Let me introduce the first um, panelist. This is Ani Sinem. Sinemaki, the Deputy Mayor of Helsinki, um, Deputy Mayor for Urban Environment. I would love to hear your thoughts in around about five minutes on uh, what you think the opportunities and risks are that we can see with the Recovery and Resilience Facility. Hello, everyone, uh, and greetings from uh, Helsinki. Uh, and thank you for the invitation uh, to participate uh, in this panel. Um, this is one of the last things uh, I will be doing before heading uh, on to vacation. So it's, uh, it's a good way to, uh, to uh, spend the Friday afternoon. Uh, as it was said, uh, I'm Anne Sinemäki, Deputy Mayor of the city of Helsinki, and I I thought to um, speak to you a bit on two levels or of two levels, uh, both the national level and uh, national uh, recovery and resilience plan, and also then take in some of the points that we have been working on uh, here in Helsinki. Uh, as probably uh, every one of you knows, uh, Greens are part of the current uh, coalition government uh, of Finland, uh, where we have the Social Democratic Prime Minister Sanna Marin, and the Greens are represented by three ministers, um, among which uh, Mrs. Krista Mikkonen, who is the Climate and Environment Minister, has been mostly working uh, with our national plan. One of the things uh, that we have been here in Finland uh, happy, uh, us Greens and some others as well, was that the uh, green transition, uh, the climate um, efficiency part in the Finnish national plan uh, was put to the level of uh, at least 50% of the whole package. Uh, and that, that has been something, of course, uh, what the European Greens also have been demanding, that the 37% would be just the minimum level, but most of the national plans would actually then uh, have a higher percentage. And when the national plan here in Finland was um, made public, uh, the Greens uh, were happy to uh, say that 
Um, as a package, uh, this is the single most uh, significant climate investment package that we have had here in Finland. Uh, our total uh, share or the estimation of the Finnish total share at the moment is roughly 2 billion euros. Um, and the whole green transition part uh, consists of 800 million euros, but then also um, measures in the digi digitalization and also employment uh, and skills part, those have climate transition and green transition elements. So that's how it's um, all together made, uh, made roughly, um, roughly 50% uh, of the whole package or whole national plan. Uh, I think that um, what I'm personally still sort of, um, I think we have to be really careful. And I think the whole uh, tracking uh, idea of tracking and being really careful and um, having the discussion going on and having the dialogue with the commission uh, will be extremely important. Uh, since the concrete projects uh, and mm, the overall understanding that what are the actual, where will the actual money in the end go to, that I think needs here in Finland, as I feel uh, almost everywhere, it needs our um, monitoring and uh, uh, that we have to be careful that we do it till the end that uh, the goals that we have set as Greens and the goals that we have negotiated into the packages will be really taken care of. In the Finnish uh, national plan, uh, there is quite significant allocation to hydrogen technology and also to uh, capture of the uh, carbon dioxide. Um, I'm not sure if, the, if this is the best approach, but um, I suppose that since there is a lot of investment on climate going on already, so perhaps this is um, this kind of money, then mm, it's good to try to create something new as well. And like uh, you probably know, but still want to remind uh, you that the um, Finnish national government has set its goal to be carbon neutral by 2035. And the same goes uh, for the city of Helsinki. So our goal also is to be carbon neutral by 2035. So that is also, of course, this is a national framework where we are working. Um, then um, quite significant allocation uh, will go to uh, projects of circular economy. Uh, and then there's sort of category of simply just reducing the uh, reducing the uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, also, the um, energy networks, um, those are allocated funds. And I think that seems to be a rational thing since renewable energy shares, when they are increasing, um, uh, that, uh, that also the networks uh, need investment quite seriously. Then there's part uh, of the um, energy efficiency uh, of the, um, uh, of the uh, built environment that we have also considered really important uh, in Helsinki. And a um, bit exceptionally from other national plans uh, to traffic, uh, to transport systems, the Finnish plan does not allocate uh, as much. When we have been working uh, in Helsinki to make our own proposals to the national plan, I would say that uh, since Helsinki, um, we still have uh, two coal power plants. Uh, first, one of those will be closed permanently forever uh, in the spring 2023. And the second one, we are currently working uh, on replacing it the deadline is uh, 2029, when the national law also says that it's you are not allowed to burn coal anymore uh, in Finland. Our goal in Helsinki is to uh, make that closing of the last coal power plant earlier. And our main target uh, is to 
uh, apply these funds to make the transition here in Helsinki. We also had in Helsinki proposals, we had more significant share for the transportation system, but that is not part of the uh, Finnish national plan. Um, and then as a last point, since I think I already uh, spent my time uh, to biodiversity or to other environmental projects, uh, there's a small share for them mainly to, um, to um, handle the uh, uh, fields, the um, agricultural uh, uh, phosphorus and those things, uh, preventing them to go in, into the uh, waterways and to the sea. So that is mainly what is allocated for the, uh, uh, for the environmental purposes. But um, as to close, uh, I, I at least here from Finland, I really welcome the uh, European Greens um, views and efforts to track the national plans uh, till till all through all the years that we are doing the implementation. Because at least the Finnish uh, system, um, mainly the money will be allocated through channels that do already exist. So we need to be careful and uh, active uh, till all the money is uh, will be spent well. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Annie. I think this was a very good account of what a recovery for the planet could actually look like. And I thank you also for reminding us and, and asking us and urging us to keep up the scrutiny also in the implementation phase, which will probably be, you know, the actual uh, program. So uh, very good that, that you um, make us aware of that again. So now I want to pass over to my colleague uh, Sven Gigold. He's also the spokesperson for the Greens EFA and the European Parliament uh, in the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee. So very interested to hear your perspective on the recovery for the planet. Well, uh, thanks first of all. Um, and uh, I would say um, this is of course a groundbreaking program. And uh, I think it cannot be stressed enough that it is a groundbreaking program. It is groundbreaking because for the first time there's a common spending um, program as a reaction to a crisis, which is uh, financed uh, based on common issuance of debt, which is being repayment paid on common taxation. And uh, it's also including a very strong uh, solidarity and transfer dimension because it's unlike what we know from the European budget, very strongly redistributive uh, in its core. So while at the European budget, we have on some millions, huge million, billions, huge debates about um, so-called who is receiving and who is giving and net payments and, and all the rest of it, this is much uh, more reduced. So it's a groundbreaking program. And from an economic perspective, as the money is more or less going into investment, it is also uh, economically useful because uh, over the last uh, 15 years, uh, basically also with the Maastricht uh, criteria, we have seen a strong tendency in public budgets, uh, not to reduce spending, but to reduce the investment component uh, in the spending. So the quality of spending has not gone up. And therefore it is very important that this program first concentrates on investment and second investment into green and digital. So we are clearly setting priorities for the future, for future generations and uh, for, a, for a Europe, which is also competitive and prosperous in the future. And uh, therefore, I would say it's truly groundbreaking. At the same time, uh, we are seeing that uh, this, uh, even with this strong legitimacy, because uh, from an economic, from a green, from an investment perspective, uh, we are still seeing a huge attack to say, this was a one-time um, accident. Uh, so uh, the EPP um, in the parliament, also in Germany, are basically already announcing, we will never do that again. If I understand correctly, what happened in Finland is uh, the agreement by the Finnish parliament was only made because you promised we will never do this horrible thing again. 
Yeah. So this is a one-off accident. Yes, but for us Greens, it's not a one-off accident. We have very clearly in our program that we want a future investment uh, uh, tool for the union, uh, which follows basically the model, but not in the sense of institutions, because what the parliament here accepted means a budget outside of the budget. So uh, what uh, Damian and uh, Bado, everybody from us is now doing is really an attack on parliamentary democracy. We have to beg for information from the member states, from the commission. Normally budgetary rights are at the center of parliamentary rights so that we cannot see the spending programs in detail as we want ex ante it is really not normal. And I have to say, uh, we need an investment uh, program, but in the future, in the full, uh, in the full agreement, uh, or in the full alliance with the institutions we have built for the EU budget. And at the same time, I have to say, I also find it uh, rather embarrassing how the commission president is traveling through Europe, giving out checks uh, like a bad politician handing over to, do to receivers some presents from a paternalistic state. Uh, in particular, if she doesn't Im at the same time name the problems. So the recent one, the approval of the Slovenian program, while at the same time the Slovenian uh, government obstructs uh, the common European prosecutor by not naming uh, the prosecutors, although this institution is there to control the use, effective use and legal use of funds. So therefore, uh, this, I have to say I'm also ashamed by the German program. The German program uh, is quite green, is quite digital. We cannot control fully how far this is the case, but looks fine, yeah? But this is of course ironic. If you have a large enough country you can make a program very green while ignoring the structural reforms of the um, country specific recommendations, which are for Germany really useful. Uh, they are basically green party program line, uh, but nothing of that is coming. Uh, and uh, on top, you simply recycle spending, which you had planned anyway. 80% of the German program spending is pure political recycling. So they are only refinancing with euro bonds what they would have otherwise financed with German government bonds. Uh, the French program looks very much the same. And the, <clears throat> and the commission didn't dare to intervene. They said, that's okay, criteria met. Although if all countries would simply recycle some elements of their budget, the macroeconomic effect would be near zero. So therefore, it's always the same. If you allow the largest countries to fiddle with the rules, to do things which don't work, you cannot hold anyone else accountable. And the big danger is that the result is that what we really need, that this groundbreaking program is a success so that we get the legitimacy for more of such common investment programs, that this will be ruined. And therefore the work of the parliament, but also national and European parliament to control the implementation is absolutely crucial because we cannot be happy if EPP and center-right can say this was a one time in 100 years response of Europe. We want a Europe which invests into its future also in the next budget cycle and we're on climate change, on digitalization, if you look at the green spending and the digital spending in Europe and compare it with China and the US, then you know why we need to do more in common. And for this, we need a successful conclusion of RRF and will remain in support of the program while critical on the details and the implementation. Uh, this is the dialectic approach uh, I would recommend, like to see from us as we have taken it so far. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Sven, for this uh, strong advocate uh, advocacy for uh, a European fiscal architecture. Uh, as you know, I share your passion for that. So uh, thanks a lot for, for bringing that up and also showing the shortcomings and that the Commission needs to be strong now in order to make this a permanent uh, thing.
So um, the next panelist I want to give the floor to is Felix Heimann, uh, who I've worked with also closely and when, when trying to identify issues of greenwashing and because they set up a great project with E3G, um, and which is called the Green Recovery Tracker Project. And so, Felix, what do you think? Will this program help us to get for recovery for the uh, planet, uh, you know, ready? Thank you very much, Damian. And thanks for the invitation. Good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here. As Damian said, my name is Felix Heimann. I'm a researcher at the climate think tank E3G, and we've been working with the Wuppertal Institute, but also with national partners, so think tanks, NGOs on the ground in most of your member states analyzing recovery plans in those countries and trying to figure out, are they green enough? Are they actually contributing to the green transition? And the verdict, I think it's, uh, it's a bit of a yes and no verdict as is so often the case in politics. Um, I think the perspective we need to take on this is really the perspective from an, a great increase in ambition, but also urgency to act on climate. We've got the new EU climate law, which may not be perfect, but I think it really sets out the direction of travel. So we're really on this transformative path also with the European Green Deal. We've got unprecedented historically, I think, support for green investments in the last year or so from the International Energy Agency, the World Bank, the IMF, all these traditionally perhaps more conservative organizations. They were all saying now is the time to invest into green. And I think that's important to say because that's the backdrop to analyze plans from. The plans don't need to be better than business as usual. They need to really live up to the sort of transformative um, demands and the ambition in that. And I think what's very clear from the work we've done, looking at national plans and how they've been written. So we've been doing this for over a year by now is that most governments, and there were some notable exceptions, didn't set out to write transformative plans. So we can see in many, many plans, we hear from many partners, uh, the way it was being approached was, okay, governments essentially went into project lists they had from the past, things perhaps they wanted to finance through other sources. As Sven Giegold just mentioned, refinancing is a big issue, looked at probably projects they couldn't get financing from elsewhere, and then said, okay, let's put this into the recovery plan. And the result is that many plans are essentially a bit patchy when it comes to having an overall strategy. And there's some exceptions. I'm really glad Annie is here today, because actually I think Finland probably did the best job from the plans we've looked at so far and really being strategic and really not looking from, we've got money, how do we spend it? But really looking at how do we need to spend money to get to the targets we need to achieve on the green transition, for example. So from that point of view, I don't think the plans are green or transformative enough. Um, sort of across the board, obviously different countries do differently. At the same time, um, we've seen that the regulation uh, on the recovery and resilience facility and the methodology enshrined in it, the climate taking methodology were extremely important for ensuring that the plans at least include a decent amount of green investments. We've seen in many countries, um, so Slovenia, Poland, but also Germany, for example, that plans throughout the drafting process got successively greener. And um, this clearly shows that governments didn't initially wanted to write a very green plan, but uh, the pressure from the commission, but also I think crucially the pressure that came through the regulation really had a difference there in making sure that the plans got greener. So did it go far enough? Not necessarily, but it certainly had this impact. Uh, this means that now at the end of the process in many countries, we have a lot of spending for green measures on paper. Uh, we don't necessarily have it where it would be most needed from the point of view of the overall green transition, um, but we have that spending. Um, we'll now, I think we need to see how that money is being spent. Uh, for example, one example is many countries on paper meet the 37% climate spending criterion based on the methodology. Um, but the thing, I mean, for example, um, new built homes with high net energy efficiency standards, the things they invest in aren't necessarily the things that are really the core drivers for the green transition. So it's not the thing with the highest leverage, but at least it's money going into something green. So we got that development. And I think over the last months, the pressure that came from, from your group, but also from other groups we've been in contact with on problematic projects and those rotten apples has been really important. Um, and I think we can learn a lot of interesting things from this process as well about the governance of EU funds, but also the EU green transition more generally. This sort of leveling up exercise we've seen between essentially the commission and governments has, I think, not necessarily been the best model for how we can get all the way to net zero because it's been sort of based on the zero sum approach and really trying to essentially somehow scrape past what's necessary rather than really, uh, in a way, aiming, aiming for the goal we need to get to. Um, and I think that's a challenge also for the European Commission as the guardian of, of course, the European treaties, but also the European funds in a way, especially after the European Parliament didn't get a binding say in this process. And we've picked up some concerns in member states from our national partners around uh, the lacking public positioning on the Commission, even though they may have been active behind the scenes on participation, on transparency, really having been an issue. So overall, where do we stand now? As I said, we have assessments from the Commission coming out now that appear overall solid based on the recovery and resilience facility methodology. 
We can also tell that the commission doesn't always like the plans. I just looked at, for example, the assessment of Slovenia just this morning and found a very, uh, I found interesting sentence in there on, from the green perspective saying that, and this is um, a verbatim quote, the impact of the proposed renewable investments in the plan to achieve the 2030 renewables targets are expected to be moderate to low, which I guess is a diplomatic way of saying it's, it's just not good enough. But the commission doesn't really have a choice but accepting those plans based on the regulation. Um, we have the same issue on biodiversity where the binding regulation, as Damian said, isn't there. So these plans are being accepted, even though they're really, um, with very few exceptions, are doing very badly on that account in particular. And last but not least, and I want to conclude in this, we have some very problematic behavior in specific instances on how also the commission deals with the climate tagging. And I think one very prominent example are hybrid cars, which are being accepted as a 40% climate contribution, even though they're not in the annex on climate tagging, even though they're not best in class solutions. Um, so that's really problematic. And we also, again, showing the importance of the rules, have some cases like support for gas boilers, which are being accepted to some extent in line with what the commission has said they will do but not in line with what we think we need for the green transition. So again, we can learn a lot from this process as well about the importance of the rules. So overall, I mean, I think to conclude, um, we know that the green investments are necessary one way or the other. We have the targets now. So every green investment that is not coming through the recovery facility needs to come from somewhere else, from private finance, from a different source of public finance. So the game is still on. Um, governments should make good use of this money. And to be honest, they're the ones who have to find other financing sources if they don't use this one well. So that's, I think, also part of the challenge for them moving forward. Thank you, Felix. And um, thank you also for, for bringing up the hybrid cars. Uh, I mean, this is a, a battle of, of ours for sure. I mean, uh, I remember that when we were actually discussing the tracking methodology, um, we tried to really limit it to what we have to, had defined, but obviously there's always loopholes being put in and to actually make hybrid cars sound as green spending uh, or like count as green spending was uh, was one of the more tricky uh, moves done by the governments. Yeah? So thanks for, for mentioning that one as well. To get to our um, last speaker on the panel, and then we can also get into the Q&A. Um, so maybe let me just quickly ask all the participants, everyone who's viewing, if you have a question, you now have the chance to soon raise your hand. I mean, please do that. And then we will also promote you to the stage so you can ask your questions um, and uh, get them ready. You can also post them in the chat or if you want in the Q&A tool, all of this is uh, helpful and uh, will enrich our conversation. So please feel free to do that. And with this, I pass on to Rosella Muroni, who is uh, from the Puglia constituency, an MP in the national, um, uh, on the national level, member of the Environment and Territory and Public Works Committee, committee and also member of the Borough of Green Italia. So I'm uh, very interested to hear also from your side what you uh, think uh, can uh, the RF do for a green recovery. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity, because this is the right uh, uh, moment to discuss not only about the uh, national uh, uh, recovery plans, but also about the future of Europe. The Mayor Budapest said that uh, Europe is a communi community uh, in order to reconstruct our society through the plans and through the investments that Europe wants to make uh, for itself and its member states. So I believe that this uh, recovery and resilience plans uh, are sort of test for the future of Europe because Europe must prove to be able, capable, uh, present for the future, to be a value added for the life quality of citizens. So our task is really to uh, um, get out of the uh, conference rooms a process of participation, identity vis-a-vis -vis the European dimension. We are experiencing, we are in a moment of the history of Europe, uh, where Europe has to prove uh, that it understood which is its role. So about the Italian national plan, I've got an adjective that I can uh, say it is disappointing, disappointing below our possibilities, our capabilities as a country. And uh, I would like to give you some examples. First of all, it is a plan which ignores the Italian talents. Italian talents are companies, enterprises of the green economy. 
and we've got approximately 500,000 enterprises uh, which invested uh, in environmental quality. And these companies are those who are having problems now. I'm sorry, I can't hear anything. I do apologize, but I can't hear. There is no, I can't hear it. Um, Rosella, um, can you wait one second? Uh, because currently there apparently is no translation. Um, so just one second until we have uh, that figured out. Okay. Grazie tanto molto. Okay. Gentile. Uh, now we can hear. Now we hear. Okay. We, now possiamo, we hear. Possiamo Rosella. continuare. Morone. Tutto a posto adesso. Okay. Grazie. Uh, so I can go ahead. Well, the Italian talents, I was mentioning the Italian talents. Uh, it was an Italian woman who invented uh, the uh, alternative, the vegetable polymer alternative to plastics. Uh, and we have the uh, opportunity and the possibility to do a lot uh, with regard to green economy. And so the uh, national, our uh, national plan does not take into account these uh, characteristics. Uh, then there is also a problem of participation because we, the Italian uh, um, parliament members, uh, came to know the contents of the plan uh, a few hours before voting it. Uh, and it is a plan which invests uh, very little on renewables uh, and, uh, you know, no, we are the sunshine country, so we should have a um, plan that uh, should invest uh, on uh, solar panels a lot. We are a peninsula, but we are a European country where we have not uh, made a, an offshore or a plant, so uh, offshore plant. So, um, and this is important if we wanted to reach the objectives uh, with regard to the reduction of uh, the emission and uh, the uh, targets regarding renewable energy. So um, this is a plan which does not uh, involve uh, groundbreakingly and revolutionarily the uh, Italian cities. We have 14 metropolitan areas. Only Milan can be considered a European city because our capital, uh, Rome, is the only European capital which uh, drives down, draws down the uh, national GDP. So we should use the Italian uh, cities uh, in order to do what uh, the uh, Recovery and Resilience Plan should do, that is to say to multiply the uh, capability of innovation and uh, investment on green and transformation. And the Resilience and Recovery Plan is an opportunity in order to uh, transform countries. It's a plan which does not invest so much in public transportation, a lot on high speed train. I uh, I'm sure that the high speed line shall be made, but I remember that uh, Italian, uh, uh, the Italian uh, uh, infrastructure, the all the Italian territory is uh, uh, violating the um, um, atmosphere pollution in the city. So I think that it is a plan with lost opportunities. Uh, in the parliament, uh, my uh, group, uh, uh, my group uh, abstained from voting it, but it is a plan which was uh, highly criticized by the Green um, Party, the Green Italians, which uh, uh, hoped for a, a vote against because with regard to potentialities, uh, um, we could do much more than uh, biological and agriculture and uh, biodiversity were absent as well as uh, with regard to uh, water management, water depuration uh, and water infrastructure. I believe that it is important to maintain a constructive dialogue and critical dialogue. Uh, so to be uh, you know, sort of being always provocative, uh, trying to uh, solicit uh, Draghi's government so that the reforms relating to this re resistance recovery plans uh, uh, are, you know, correct. Because, you know, it, it, we have all the headings uh, of this plan. What uh, we're not convinced about is the quality of resources which have been uh, placed in uh, one on, on one side rather than on another side. We have uh, requested 4 billion uh, 
uh, Euro 4 hydrogen. And then in reality, uh, hydrogen is a way to uh, hide and conceal and give new life to gas system. And, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, the European Union uh, noticed this uh, because uh, hydrogen must be green, cannot be blue. Uh, but it was so complicated to explain it uh, to the um, large Italian groups, uh, to the Italian government. Uh, we told uh, the Italian government, uh, Europe, starting from the do not uh, significant, uh, uh, do significant harm principles, uh, would say something, would say something, because the Italian plan cannot be a, a, a plan to uh, make Italy as a big gas uh, hub and to link our energy system to a fossil uh, uh, energy like a gas, which is proposed to us in order to get out of the, to phase out from the coal. You know, the gas, uh, well, uh, we, in, in, the, in the 90s, we said that gas was a transition uh, fuel, but uh, saying so now really condemns Italy to be a gas hub uh, being stuck with the fossil energy. And we cannot uh, uh, do that, you know, we Perfect. cannot afford it. The planet cannot afford it. So I think that it will be fundamental to go on, to continue working on this uh, resilience and recovery plan in synergy and in the networking with Europe. It is really fundamental to really switch the discussion, the debate uh, from Italy uh, to the European Union level, because uh, we're not speaking about 200 billion. We got uh, the uh, greatest part, uh, the largest part um, uh, for our country. But however, this country uh, for us, uh, this plan for us must be really an opportunity. So Sven uh, was saying before, a model, a tool. In Italy, it must be a method. So to understand how we're going to make the reforms that the European Union is asking from us, uh, because we have not been able to do that uh, for years. So it is important to have uh, really an open uh, dialogue with the dark government and then it will be fundamental to understand how it will be possible to use the community conventional community funds perfect uh, Rosella, I think thank you so much <laughs> thank you perfect I, um now we are perfectly on time because now it's exactly um 3 p.m so it means we have uh, 30 minutes for our q a so thanks a lot for for these very in interesting um Introductory remarks. I mean, I think if you look at it, Rosella, your last point on the network and on exchange uh, on the European level, this is exactly what we're doing. We have uh, European parliamentarians here. We have the local level and the ma deputy mayor here. We have you as a national parliamentarian and we have the NGO community represented. So with this together, I think we will be able to hopefully, you know, further this debate and, and to, to push this forward. Thanks a lot for, for putting this forward. So a lot of questions came up, at least in my mind already. Uh, when listening to uh, the four of you. So let's see if there's already um, a question by the audience. Again, for the audience, you, uh, you can raise your hand and then you can be promoted uh, to, to speak here on the panel with us. Um, but until that's the case, or you can also ask by the Q&A tool. Until that's the case, uh, I might have a, a first a question to, to you, Sven, um, on the green bonds. I think, uh, I mean, you might have heard that the Commission also wants to spend a certain amount of money um, or like when it raises the money, the debt um, on the European level for, uh, for all the spending that we just uh, talked about, it also wants to do that with green bonds. Do you have any specific thought on how that actually promotes the green recovery? Um, uh, I would say uh, hardly at all, uh, because uh, the economic effect of issuing green bonds is uh, comparably marginal in comparison to what is being done with the money. So if the money would have been raised on the gray market, so uh, with no green standards, the effect on greening would be more or less the same. However, uh, so I think sustainable finance is good, but uh, the economic consequences are widely exaggerated because when it's coming to greening, what really matters is how do we produce, what do we consume? and not how we finance it. And that is often forgotten when speaking green finance. However, I have to say, of course, issuing so many green bonds will give the green bond market a, a boost. And by that way, making this market more liquid, it will together with the green bond issuance of the German government, 
create a certain zone of what is the pricing for a green bond. Uh, and this will serve in comparison to other green financing instruments um, as a sort of benchmark. So therefore, the, a green benchmark will be created, uh, a risk-free uh, interest rate um, will be created, you could say. And that is interesting from a finance perspective and economists like you and me, we may get thrilled by this. Uh, uh, beyond that, um, I would say, uh, let's concentrate on the substance, CO2 pricing, public infrastructure, changing of consumption and product patterns. Let's not get distracted. Uh, yeah, so this Perfect. is good, but um, keep calm and do the investment. Perfect. Then we, will focus, uh, then we will focus back on the investment side. Annie, I really like that you talked about the implementation. And so, I mean, from the European Parliament level, I can tell you, we are trying to fight uh, for quite, you know, a big transparency on how the money is actually spent. But we have limits um, because also the Commission has limits on how much data they get from the national governments. And then the money is not ultimately tied to exact projects, but it's actually just transferred once you reach certain milestones. So there are still issues, and I will ask Felix on, on design improvements uh, in a second. But I wanted to just ask you, Ani, um, how do you control the implementation, the correct implementation on the local level where you actually have the power to do that? Thank you. Um, I think that uh, what uh, anyway uh, will be needed would be a really good cooperation between the European level and European Parliament Green Group and the national ones. Uh, and um, here in Finland, of course, I think that as long as we are part of the national government, um, I think on behalf of them, although I'm in the city level, I would welcome uh, as close cooperation and discuss, discussion as possible. And I also think that, of course, from the government, but probably also uh, from the from opposition in the national government, uh, in the national parliament, uh, it's good to cooperate so that every national parliament would follow as uh, keenly as possible and also that the national um, governments would follow uh, the implementation and not only the implementation on the project level, but somehow the achieved change in emissions uh, and with different criteria um, with the, however you uh, monitor the level of digitalization or of course there are health issues as well in the Finnish plan. There's also some money allocated to the um, health uh, services that have been um, suffer, suffering from the crisis. Um, and um, I think that what is really hard, uh, I find, uh, as what Sven um, described, that if in the national level, the, uh, the, um, it's actually done so that the money that otherwise would be spent uh, will be now spent with this money. And that is, of course, really hard. And I think that is why we also need a really strong fight uh, and work for, um, for the climate targets of 2030, because if we succeed in them, then it's sort of some money has to be spent for that as well. But... Um, I think that um, climate targets, in a way, it's still easier than some other things to measure how we are progressing. And of course, then um, innovation, the transform of the economy, um, those things, I think that we then need common discussion, be it with the commission, with, be, with the green political group, um, what we are actually looking at and what are the facts that would be most useful to look at. But certainly the cooperation between the national level and the, uh, and the European level will be needed. And really more from the Helsinki side, I think that our work also is quite practical that we will uh, work with the energy company that we own and we will send applications on the uh, transformation of the uh, heat uh, district heating system. And then we are just uh, having sort of a loud voice that this is something that whole Finland needs in order to reduce, uh, to get the carbon neutrality target uh, by 2035. Perfect. Also to all panelists, always feel free to interrupt each other. I think that makes the debate more lively. 
Um, Felix, I mean, to be honest, like having negotiated this this law together with Ernest, the you know the one key question I constantly ask myself is what should I have done differently? You know, is there one thing that I should have fought for that might have made it through? You know, the coalition of of all the big groups uh, in, and uh, also against the member states and the German ambassador who was very <laughs> pushy on, on on a lot of issues, but I mean. What would, from your perspective, uh, have eased the, the green recovery um, and uh, actually also the transparency on what's correct and so on, if you look at the law now and, and how this is all set up with the milestones and the top down and bottom up and so on? What is the one element where you would say, okay, this or maybe can also be two, yeah, but what would be the most important thing to change in the, in the law itself? Well, wow, that's a great and a big question. Um, so, so I don't want to speak too much about the political side of it because because you're the experts on that and what would have gotten through the EP. But I think from what we've seen in the assessment process, it's probably, um, well, I'd say two, two and a half things, if I may. Um, and sort of one and a half are on the sort of technical side and one is on the more sort of strategic, um, how good are these plans sort of from a, a bird's eye point of view side. Um, on the technical side, I think, one thing that has been a bit of a problem in our point of view, again, I'm not saying that this would have been possible to negotiate into the regulation, but in hindsight, is that the do no significant harm criterion had some loopholes, and we know that the whole issue of gas is especially very politically controversial up to the very highest level right now, but uh, there are some things that can now sail through the DNSH test that perhaps uh, from a purely green transition point of view shouldn't happen. I mean, things like fossil gas boilers, which uh, the commission essentially allows under very specific criteria sort of other measures accompanying them but then there are question marks on whether these are actually given so so that is a bit of a i think i think of a weak spot but again i mean we've seen the dnsh criteria that's in there actually having a huge impact and actually removing all of the measures so i think it already has done a positive impact but um, there probably would have been even more potential again i don't know whether that's politically would have been feasible but uh, that would have been good and i think another thing i've been thinking on reading the Commission's assessment, because um, we essentially with the tracker, we also came up with green spending share. So what we did was very similar to what the Commission also did. And then obviously people asked us, okay, now we have these different numbers. We've got the government number saying we, we're spending so and so much on green. And then we've got the Commission actually often not one to one taking the government number, but coming up with a different number. Um, and then there's also um, sort of our number, which obviously isn't as prominent, but also out there in the world. Um, it might have been useful if the Commission would have had to deliver more proof on why they buy certain criteria. Because right now it's a bit patchy in some of the documents they give. Um, and they sort of choose what they write about and they give those milestones. The milestones and targets, by the way, they differ between countries, which on the one hand, I understand because countries differ. On the other hand, on hydrogen, for example, there are significant differences. I mean, the French are allowed to essentially get money for hydrogen when they produce renewable and low carbon hydrogen. Now that's of course nuclear in France, but low carbon in Eastern Europe means uh, fossil gas, which is concerning. The Germans, uh, the, the goal they need to achieve on hydrogen is just spending a certain amount of money and then they get more money. Um, in Italy, it includes research funding for grid powered hydrogen, which is the most polluting way to produce hydrogen, um, even though uh, I think there have been improvements on the inclusion of blue hydrogen and fossil gas. So, so there's sort of these sort of different playing fields in different countries and more clarity. And last thing I'll say, because I've spoken for a while, uh, I think it would have been great if the plans would have been more strongly linked with the increase in climate ambition. So probably legally that wasn't possible, but we will now see a new raft of um, uh, essentially uh, national energy and climate plans through the new EU climate target, which most recovery plans, with very few exceptions, don't live up to. So that I think is a challenge that essentially now needs to that needs to find more funding that needs to um, essentially again create a new wave of ambition. And if that would have been sort of done now already, probably our lives in one or two years' time, and also government's lives, by the way, um, could have been easier. Yeah, I think uh, I mean on gas at least we had the battle. Yeah, we tried. Uh, I think that uh, we couldn't uh, get it further. That's that's uh, I think correct. But on your last point, on the, I think on the whole question of you know, what kind of future uh, references should we have put into um, the, the RF? I mean, there we have the issue that as legislators, we're a bit bound to what's already there, I guess, to a certain extent. Yeah. So I think, I mean, this critique that uh, we should have actually put the future climate targets in, in more into perspective, I think, is very valid, but was very difficult, I have to say, in the negotiations. Is that. So and do you want to come back on nuclear before I go to um, Rosella? No, no, I only wanted to tease uh, Felix because I haven't spent uh, without uh, in, uh, lots of time of my youth blocking nuclear trains in order to learn now that this is less concerning than ga fossil gas. So uh, uh, we should be very careful on this. We don't want nuclear, we don't want fossils. 
and uh, we have the technology ready for the renewables. Okay. And I, I'm dead against uh, opening any rhetorical door for anything here. So uh, I have an allergy against nuclear energy. That's all. Uh, huh? Perfect. Thanks a lot. Felix, do you want a uh, one sentence rebuttal? And then uh, I, I quickly maybe then, hand. Uh, not a rebuttal, just to say perhaps I wasn't clear then. I, I agree. And I think that's an example of the very dangerous cycle we see with sort of proponents of nuclear, proponents of fossil gas in the European Union, sort of by arguing for what they want, creating space for the other thing as well. And I think that's just a dangerous cycle that we need to break. So I agree. Perfect. Then maybe let's uh, give us, and I saw your hand, Annie, but maybe let's give quickly Rosella also the chance uh, to, to come in. I, I mean, my question to you, Rosella, um, is that, you know, as Sven said earlier, if you <laughs> put the German and the Italian plan next to each other, the Italian plan is a wonder, you know, it has ambition, it is actually trying to change something, it really, you know, is not greenwashing as much, at least uh, after the commission has actually assessed it and improved it with minds and, uh, milestones and targets. So um, I was just wondering, uh, first of all, why, why did you think it was not ambitious enough? And then very precisely um, on the trains, I was quite uh, surprised that you said that, you know, sometimes trains can be actually helpful. And sometimes trains cannot be so helpful. So maybe if you can help us, you know, understand why a train is not a train uh, and is not always helpful in, in, when it comes to the green recovery, I think that would be extremely uh, helpful for us as well. Thank you. Good questions. So first of all, we abstained because I do not believe that it is a draft plan and should be rejected. I think that it could be much better because I do believe in my country, I know my country, and we should have been more ambitious. We should have run more quickly than others on renewables, on city, re city buildings, reconversion. We should have made choices, but we lost so many months because as any other countries, we tried to put anything in the um, plan. We tried to put the bridge to, to the Messina strict as well. And uh, the European Union has said several times that they wouldn't um, finance it. So the rail mobility is a strategic asset, but it's a matter of a priority. I would have invested on commuting services and we needed to free our cities uh, from cars and we can do that only if we ensure commuting by train there are six million commuters in italy that take their cars and uh, they should be given the opportunity to um, take the train instead of taking their car. And most of these cars are, fuel, are fueled with diesel. So this is a matter of a priority. This is why I don't think that these plans should be rejected. It could be more ambitious. I think that for our country, Mr. Draghi is essential to comply with European commitments. This uh, plan will mean more debt for our country. If we go back to the stability pack, the austerity strategy, I would be so worried for my country. So these European network should be kept alive. We shouldn't be selfish. We should create a European system as a European continent that wanted to be a leader in fighting climate change. Perfect. And thanks a lot. That, that makes it a lot clearer uh, for me. I think that is, is a very good um, explanation of, of, of what makes more sense. I'm still, I mean, um, I'm wondering a bit because I think, I mean, obviously we have a lot of criticism together and I think it, it's also important to deep dive and uh, further into it and I'll do it in a second. But I was also wondering about something that, that Sven said about this being a quite a unique new program um, of actually, you know, Eurobonds financing uh, a common recovery. And here I was also wondering, I mean, 
37% spent on, on greening sounds like a lot. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the majority. I mean, it's not more than 50%, but it's really like a big uh, share of it if you think about the fact that there are six uh, pillars of this instrument. So is this too little or is this too much? And, and here with this, I wanted to ask Annie what she thinks. Is it too little to spend 37% of each national recovery plan on, on green spending or is it too much? Um, I'd rather say that um, too little. I think the Finnish approach where it's uh, raised to 50 uh, is better. Um, I think also that it's not, of course, so simple because do no significant harm. Combined with this, it makes the 37 uh, better than it would be uh, without it. And then I also think that here the devil lies in the details a bit that, uh, like here, it, it has been said that, okay, if, if 37% includes some um, uh, some money to help people buy hybrid cars that uh, mostly use uh, petrol, then it's not really, uh, really so good. But I think that if we think of the urgency of the climate crisis, and if we think of the slowness of any um, investment cycles, uh, then I think that at least 37%, it's not too little. Okay, um, Sven, on the, on the um, too little and too much, but maybe going back to the fiscal architecture, do you think, um, I mean, what do you think is the next best step? This is more out of my interest, but like what, what the common fiscal architecture could actually look like. How do we get there and what is the, the, the right way? Look, um, I think that uh, actually the um, the next step is that uh, people will look to America and see public investment going up. Uh, they will look to China uh, achieving ever more successes. And uh, there's simply a European necessity for, bring, for ensuring larger cross-border investments. I personally believe that the quota for the green, whether it's 37 or 50, and well, of course, as a green, I prefer 50 than 37. But in the end, the problem is we have uh, not Erasmus for all. We have small research budgets in future industries. Uh, we lack a common social infrastructure. And, uh, and uh, we have the whole greening issue and we lack the infrastructure for the greening, including common energy grids and uh, a proper train network, which allows us environmentally friendly cross-border uh, travel. So all this is such a huge effort. Uh, so therefore we should argue much more aggressively uh, for a European investment uh, budget and and that is uh, to be connected, uh, of course, with the upcoming debate on the Maastricht reforms, because the Maastricht rules will have to be reformed because they are not only stupido, as uh, Prodi once uh, said it, uh, but uh, they are also against reality. And the latter is the stronger argument, of course, because if Italy would have to apply the rules it can also take a, a, a pistol for suicide economically. So you cannot uh, in 20 years bring down uh, public debt to 60% of GDP. And the same is true for Greece. So this is a recipe for disaster and the EPP will be arguing we have to come back to fiscal austerity. And in this situation, the whole debate about public investment and European public investment will re-emerge. And I'm looking forward uh, to this discussion. I think it's uh, especially interesting also in the context of the fact that, uh, you know, the repayment um, of, of the borrowed money, um, it, since it needs to be in the frame of the MFF, will also come on top if we don't get the additional new own resources or taxes. But as you only earlier. 26 and 27 
And I have to say, there are a few years in between and Europe cannot afford in between to come back to the old austerity model in public investment. So I would like to see public investment also in 25 and 26 on a European level. And that is the issue with a view to the European elections. Perfect. I mean, now we have we've talked about borrowing, we have talked about spending, uh, and now since we have a, a couple of minutes left, maybe we can talk about taxing as well. And so, um, Felix, I don't know if you have any thoughts or any of the other speakers on uh, potential uh, taxes that can help us have a green recovery. Is there is there something that you would like to to say in this direction as well? well I can I can start, but I'm sure others will think things to add. And I think there's some. Some things, not even on the things that we, we tax, but on the fiscal side, things that we currently support, where it would be really easy to stop, just stop doing that. And we still continue to do, you know, give out fossil fuel subsidies at staggering amounts. And honestly, that's probably one of the things in when we look at the green transition, where it's uh, the, one of the lowest hanging fruits, one of the easiest, they can actually get more money if you don't do it, and you get less of a harmful behavior if you don't do it, um, where it's really quite surprising that this doesn't happen. And we've, uh, I mean, seen the commission's assessments of recovery plans in some cases as, okay, um, you know, this wasn't tackled in the recovery plan, we think that's a problem, but again, they couldn't go further. And also I think maybe we shouldn't have expected recovery plans to solve all political problems that exist in any country. Um, but but that's one of the things that I think really needs to happen. So I think that uh, opens up the question also to a green reform. So we have been talking a lot about green spending in the National Recovery and Resilience Plans. I mean, did we, uh, maybe also Rosella, do you see any form of green reforms or reforms that you actually think could help the greening of the Italian economy in the Italian recovery and resilience plan? Well, I see a, a great opportunity. As you know, we have now a um, environmental uh, transition uh, ministry. This was uh, set up for political reasons, not because the um, uh, structure of the decision-making structure has changed in our country. In any case, uh, this is the perspective that you say our challenge of uh, uh, environmental friendly group is to uh, really prove that we have a, an industrial plan for our country. We can do it if we change the mindset of our country. It is incredible that Italy uh, always questions uh, European directives uh, even when it contributes to uh, its uh, awarding or its drafting. So this is a mechanism that we have to interrupt because I repeat, I stress it, we are absolutely capable to do it because if we manage to recognize our talents, our capabilities, this is to say green enterprises and also uh, being uh, open to changes, you know, because our country is changing, is changing from the point, cultural point of view. So I believe that the European dimension is a cultural dimension which will help us a lot in order to uh, seize this opportunity. Okay, um, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for that. I don't know if any of the others wants to um, yeah, comment on the question of what kind of more green reforms we could have expected um, in, in the National Recovery and Resilience Plans. Okay. Um, if not, I think, I mean, we are reaching the end uh, of our session. Um, so if there's like one more thought that you want to make, uh, one closing quick remark, one sentence that you think should have been mentioned here and there wasn't the room for it yet, uh, this is your chance. And, but um, let's see if there's someone who would like to say, yes, Ani, please go. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to comment uh, what actually um, Sven mentioned earlier that Finland has been one of the countries where the discussion on the uh, uniqueness uh, that this is the only and last time when we do something like that, uh, that discussion has been here really strong here in Finland. And there, as you might know, there is sort of a uh, in the overall political uh, discussion in Finland, there's quite strong um, fiscal um, tightness um, sound. So it's part of the um, mentality here. And um, 
I see myself that uh, one of the things that would be really important for the Green Project would that we all do our best to monitor, to, um, uh, to follow and to uh, really get best out of these national plans, since I think that if they succeed, it sort of uh, dilutes parts of the criticisms and uh, sort of arguments used against these kind of instruments, common European instruments. So I think that uh, this is, of course, really important for us to try to succeed as well as possible. Amazing. Perfect. Actually, uh, Annie, you you have said what uh, would also have been my final remarks to a certain extent. Yeah, I think what we hear in these discussions today is that I mean the program itself is something very unique and something revolutionary in a positive sense. Yeah, also that there is a certain top-down uh, you know definition of that you need to get to thirty-seven percent and the third, like a certain uh, table you know telling you what that actually would be and also. Uh, the do no significant harm principle and fixed in there and so on and then that the from a bottom up the countries can design what is actually necessary based on some guidance i think i mean overall this program is amazing in, in that sense and also that you need to fulfill certain milestones and targets and that it's all financed by euro bonds uh, even though we're not allowed to call them that <laughs> in certain uh, circles um i think that that's absolutely amazing and now what we see, obviously, is that we run into all these issues that we generally have in the European economic system of, um, you know, how much power does the European Union have or the Commission president herself versus individual national governments. And here we see that, you know, towards some, she is a bit more pushy towards others, like my own government, the German, she basically seems to be important, like unable to get anything through. So there, there is these, you know, issues that we also see in the, in the European Union in, in general. But I think it really teaches us a lot. And it's also something that we can't go back uh, behind because it happened. And it can now, if we do the right steps, and if we really take the scrutiny Annie, that you just mentioned again, throughout the implementation phase also, obviously still for us in the approval of plans phase that, that you know, NS and I are, are heavily working on with, with a bigger team. But also then in the implementation phase, I think that that's absolutely crucial to ensure that this money is in the end spent well and that it is a success uh, also for the green recovery and the recovery of the planet. So with this, I thank all the panelists for their uh, great contributions. Thanks so much for, uh, for making the time to come here today. I hope you have an absolutely wonderful weekend. We now have a 15 minutes break before we start with the third panel. So um, everyone grab a glass of water and, um, and thanks to, to the panelists for, for making the time to speak to us today. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Annie. Uh, very good afternoon to everybody, and I bid you a very warm welcome to our today's online event for Green Recovery, especially to this panel, which is called A Recovery for the People, Social and Gender Equality. My name is Alexandra Gese. I'm a member of the European Parliament, of the Green Group, obviously, and I'm a member of the Recovery and Resilience Fund Scrutiny Group of the European we for Parliament. The first time, and this time it will work. Perfectly. Oh, no. So, uh, very good afternoon to everybody, and I bid you a very uh, warm welcome to our I'm today's online event for Green Recovery, again. especially to this panel, which is called A Recovery is, for the People. Okay, better now? Okay, perfect. I'm sorry. Um, member of the RF Scrutiny Working Group, I'm a standing rapporteur for gender mainstreaming and gender budgeting in um, the Budget Committee, and therefore I've been following these issues very, very closely and I'm very happy to discuss them today with our panel. First of all, as you all noticed, we are supposed to have interpretation and I think it's working now. So the languages are English, Italian, French, Spanish, German, and Hungarian. And you can use the language button on Zoom uh, on your screen in order to choose the right uh, language. Um, 
I would like to very briefly introduce the topic. What are we talking about today? Because we have talked a lot about the green aspect of the Recovery and Resilience Fund of Next Generation EU. But we all know that COVID has had a massive impact on social equality and on gender equality. And we have learned in the last years that the population groups that have been hardest hit are actually those with the lowest income in terms of income loss, and also in terms of health, because often what we're seeing in Germany, it's probably the same for other countries as well, that those people who live in poorer neighborhoods have a higher, um, a higher incidence of, of COVID um, illness as well. And especially from an economic point of view, um, those are the population groups who have less means, less savings in order to to face such a challenge and to have heavy, heavily um, experienced job losses. The RF is supposed to contribute to the European pillar of social rights to strengthen social institutions and protection systems among the six priorities. There are several priorities that have to do with social aspects, economic cohesion, jobs, social and territorial cohesion are especially mentioned, health and economic, social and institutional resilience and policies for the next generation for children and for youth, those such as education and, ch and children. And gender mainstreaming should be a horizontal aspect of the whole plan and as such being included in every single measure of the Recovery Resilience Fund. So today we will um, try to, with our distinguished guests, to check whether this has been implemented in reality, um, whether we can be happy with the plans, how they have been implemented concretely in countries. And we have the example with, from Italy today in order to, to learn for the future and especially for the monitoring. Um, we have um, some time now for, um, for the panel and then we will have a Q&A session. You can use the raise hand button if you want to participate in the Q&A session. You see the raise hand button close to the interpretation. And um, then we will be able to allow you to switch um, your microphone and perhaps your camera on and to ask a question, discuss with us. But you can also use the usual Q&A tool for written questions. And you can also do that from the YouTube stream. You can put your written questions in there and I will be uh, shown the questions and can ask them. Um, just be reminded that we are recording the webinar and it will be published. So if you ask your question orally, you will obviously be in the recording. So if you don't want that, you might want to prefer a written question. We are obviously happy to have you. So without further ado, very happy to introduce our distinguished speakers. Our first speaker today is Luca Vicentini. He's the Secretary General of ETOC, the European Trade Union Confederation. And as such, I think you are really in an ideal position to talk a little about, about the social aspects, about grow, growth, um, about job creation, uh, about the social scoreboard that will be very important for the monitoring and maybe a little bit about how the trade unions have been involved in the run up to, to the plans. Thank you. Then the second person we have on the panel today is Sylvia Zamboni. Um, she's vice chair of the regional assembly of Emilia Romagna from the Green Party, Federazione dei Verdi. And I think she really will focus on the Italian RP and on uh, different social aspects and the gender gap. Um, thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, last but not least, Helena Moraes Macera, who is a researcher at IGE. IGE is the European um, Institute for Gender Equality. And she will be able to present uh, key findings from IGA's research on gender equality and the social economic consequences of the COVID-19 crisis, because IGA has been a very important um, institution and has given us very important insights in what was happening to social and especially to gender equality during the crisis. We're very happy to have her today. Um, so first of all, um, our three guests on the panel will have um, five minutes for their initial input, and then we will start the Q&A. So, uh, Luca, you have the floor for your input. Thank you very much, Alexandra. I hope you can hear me and see me well. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this discussion. I think it's very 
crucial that we connect on these topics and we try also to build alliances to make sure that uh, the recovery strategy of the European Union goes in the right direction on many aspects, environmental, social, equality, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, well, uh, to, to try to reply to your inputs, uh, uh, first of all, if we want to pave the path for a, for a fair, inclusive and equal recovery, uh, we have to make sure that uh, we can come back uh, to normal in a fair way. And this is not something that happens automatically uh, because uh, uh, we are still in the middle of the pandemic, unfortunately, although there was some hope that the situation could have improved uh, quite quickly. But now with the variants, etc., we are still facing some difficulties. And what we have seen from a trade union's perspective is that, for instance, coming back to the labor market, coming back to work, uh, uh, poses many, many challenges. First of all, because uh, despite of the emergency measures uh, for uh, jobs uh, and income protections that have been uh, displayed by many, many member states, uh, well, there are so many jobs at risk. And uh, these uh, jobs at risk, uh, by the way, are affecting mainly women and young people that have been the most affected by the pandemic, by the lockdowns, by the outbreak, and now are at risk of losing their jobs, of uh, seeing their income uh, uh, permanently uh, affected by this situation. And also when they come back to work, they also face enormous problems in terms of health and safety, in terms of a decent working environment, in terms of exploitation and discrimination on the workplace. So in this respect, it's really important not to go back to business as usual, but on the contrary, to build to build a return to normal that is really fairer, more equal, and that can guarantee protection for everybody. As I say, this doesn't happen automatically. For this to happen properly, we need to have policies in place. We need to have a proper protection in place. We need to have uh, all the stakeholders, including social partners and trade unions, to play an active role, making sure that people are protected when they are coming back to work and they are coming back in the society after the outbreak. Then, of course, uh, there is uh, all a discussion going on on what should be the conditions to make sure that the recovery and the recovery plans can be really fair, inclusive and equal. In this respect, uh, I see, I will say, three main dimensions that have to be considered, at least from our point of view, the economic, the environmental and the social dimension. The economic dimension is the first one to be addressed if we want to have fairness, because, you know, we cannot just rebuild exactly the same economic model that we had before the crisis uh, coming from the pandemic. We cannot just come back to austerity and to the jobless recovery that follow the financial crisis. The recipes that have been implemented to try to react to the financial crisis from the European Union were completely wrong. They didn't protect people. They didn't protect jobs and income and working conditions. They didn't protect the environment. There was just a coming back to business, uh, making a lot of profits, uh, having very little job creation and uh, no equality. On the contrary, increasing inequalities and discrimination and segregations in the labor market and also in the society. So we cannot rebuild our economy or build our recovery on the basis of that paradigm. We need to change completely the paradigm of uh, our economic governance. And in this respect, uh, making sure that the good recovery uh, strategy that the European Union this time has established because is more based on solidarity than in the past. We have even uh, the possibility of having European bonds to, let's say, reduce the pressure on public debts at the national level. We have the possibility of having a great facility with 750 billion euros available for member states to restart and to boost uh, economic recovery. But uh, if there are no conditionalities, making sure that we can really reform our economic governance and put in place elements of protection, uh, well, we are at risk of repeating the mistakes of the past. So in this respect, the first point from our point of view is to radically reform our fiscal rules. We have to make sure that the boundaries, the wrong boundaries coming from the stability and growth pact, pact that have led in the past to austerity policies and cuts, they are removed, they are radically reformed, and we can really establish an economic model that is fairer, that is based on well-being of people, with an economy at the service of people, of the environment, of the interest of communities, making sure that 
yeah, the fiscal rules don't just serve the capital and the, and the private interest and, and profits. Uh, you know, doing that is very easy to say, but very difficult to do. Uh, walking the talk in this respect, uh, with all the resistance that comes from many, many governments, particularly the fru so-called frugal ones, but not only, uh, is very, very complex. Uh, we know that there are good intentions from the European Commission to reform the fiscal rules, to introduce a different and fairer taxation, for instance, uh, and any other things uh, like that. But despite of these good intentions, if we don't strike a balance and we cannot find more ambitious solutions in the debate with the council and with the governments, or governments from member states, it will be very difficult to modify our economic model. The second element is the environment, but not only the environment, we have also a digital transition to be managed together with the climate one. And in this respect, as you can imagine, for us, uh, the concept of just transition is really the key element that has to be at the core of uh, all recovery plans that are implemented in each and every country. And for us, just, transitions, just transition cannot simply mean that uh, we have good targets to be reached in the framework of the Green Deal. We have some money to reach these targets, but there is no control on how the money is spent, and there is no governance on the on, on the ground to make sure that the money is spent to accompany workers, citizens, and communities in this transition. And it's not even enough to say, okay, we will have skills, training, and maybe social protection to help those that are left behind because we cannot go back to the old approach that is that we just provide some compensation after the damage is done. With this kind of approach in the past, we have created too many communities that became social and economic deserts, where there were no alternative possibilities to find a job when a climate or digital transition took place and people were completely abandoned to, them, to themselves. So we need really to implement a just transition. That means that that for any job that is going to disappear because of the climate and digital transition, we can create more and more quality jobs through very targeted investment and making sure that we have strong social protection and strong labor market policies that can really help us in accompanying this transition in a proper way. Communities, stakeholders, social partners must be on board together with local authorities to manage this government, governance in the right manner. The third element, the last one, is the social dimension. You mentioned the European pillar of social rights, the scoreboard. We have now an action plan for the implementation of the European pillar of social rights that has been approved in Porto, published by the Commission, and then approved by all uh, European and national institutions. Uh, that summit was very crucial. The targets that are set in this uh, uh, action plan are very ambitious on employment, on training, on fight against poverty. They are fully in line with the SDGs of the Agenda 2030 of the United Nations. But uh, now we are really to commit all together to achieve these targets. And in this respect, uh, the social scoreboard being part of the European economic governance, but also social conditionalities when it comes to spending and investment in the framework of the recovery plans, legislation to be implemented at the European level, minimum wages, gender pay gap and gender pay transparency, uh, uh, platform work and other social and labor legislation to be delivered. And last but not least, uh, universal social protection schemes that can really help everybody to be included. All these elements must be an integral part of all recovery plans at the European and the national level. And in this dimension, the gender equality dimension must absolutely be considered. It's about equal pay, it's about non-discrimination at work, it's about labor market protection, particularly targeted for women, is about work-life balance and uh, social protection and care that should privilege women that are discriminated for too long uh, in this uh, respect. Are the national recovery and resilience plans uh, going in this direction? Are they addressing the right problems in the right manner? It's difficult to say because uh, uh, I will say social partners, stakeholders have been very little involved, unfortunately, in the design and the implementation of the national recovery plans. Uh, we have been involved quite uh, 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 fairly, I would say, in the design of the, of the European instruments, but when it comes to the national plans, uh, even 
the most progressive governments uh, have shown enormous gaps in terms of social dialogue, institutional dialogue, and involvement of social partners and stakeholders in the design of the national recovery plans. That's why, and this is my last point, it's so crucial that we all come together in alliances and cooperation to make sure that we can really monitor how the implementation and the delivery of these recovery plans will happen in practice on the ground. We have to be part of the process. Social partners, civil society organizations, political groups at the European and national level, all of us must be part of the picture. We cannot leave this just in the hands of governments and the European Commission. There should be a really democratic process in a way that we can have a say on how this recovery is shaped in a way, as I said at the beginning, that we avoid the mistakes of the past and on the contrary, we design a more sustainable economic and social model for the future, respectful of people, of the rights, of the environment, of the societies and the communities. So I really hope that initiatives like the ones today uh, can really help us in building bridges and cooperation among all of us in coordinating in a way that we can make pressure on the decision makers uh, to for them to go in the right direction and to put in place the right solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luca, for your input, for being here with us, and also for this call to alliance building, which is exactly what we share, and which is one of the reasons why we organized this event today, because I also think, especially looking at the lack of involvement of stakeholders, local stakeholders, social partners um, in the run up for the plans and for the program, this is very important that at least we achieve that during the monitoring process and in order to work for, for better economic conditions. And on what you said, I also share what you said on, on the good conditionalities and fiscal rules. And I think my colleagues Van Giegold and the previous panel already commented on that. And I think that's also something where we really need to build a strong, strong alliance. Um, our next speaker, Silvia Zamboni, Vice Chair of the Regional Assembly. What do you make of the Italian plan from the point of view as a regional lawmaker in terms of gender equality, but also in all other terms of social aspects? You have the floor, Silvia. Well, first of all, Alexandra, thank you so much for this invitation, the possibility uh, of uh, hearing uh, different points of view. Uh, from Europe, uh, I would like to add up uh, beside uh, the lack of satisfaction for the non-involvement of uh, civil society subjects uh, and association subjects, I would like to add up uh, the lack of satisfaction since I am a councillor uh, of a green, uh, green councillor in the Emilia Romagna government, uh, the fact that uh, the Italian government did not involve the region. The region. So we are a region uh, located in the uh, Padana Plain, which is one of the uh, most polluted area in Europe. So we requested that uh, the issue of uh, pollution could uh, be uh, recognized as a national emergency uh, issue um, to, that should be uh, allocated financing uh, since uh, um, atmospheric uh, pollution uh, causes uh, dozens of premature deaths uh, every year. But this was not so, and the government uh, did uh, uh, everything on its own. And now we're going to see, we'll see, because for the implementation, uh, we need, they need also to involve uh, local entities, uh, those who, which are more, which are closer to the territory than they know specifically the um, local uh, needs. With regard to the gender balance, I must say that uh, we call it uh, uh, recovery and resilience plan, national recovery and resilience plan. Well, uh, it may risk to be a lost opportunity. We start from uh, uh, women's employment. Uh, well, uh, we must say that Europe in 2010 had uh, the set the target to get 60% of women employed. And uh, from Germany and uh, the UK are around 70%. Uh, Italy achieved, reached 50% uh, in 2019 to plunge to 48% during the COVID-19 pandemic. Why? Because uh, the women's employment sectors um, that are more represented 
and representative of uh, women's employment uh, are uh, services uh, to um, the persons to say care services uh, so um, this exposed them to uh, the um, uh, virus uh, to the COVID-19 uh, contagion. And so this uh, entailed uh, a decrease in jobs. Uh, because if you think uh, about, uh, for instance, restaurants, etc., and other activities have been uh, interrupted and suspended for months. Uh, so in December, if you take December as a, a month representative of this uh, uh, drop, a decline in employment, uh, uh, we know that uh, out of 100,000 jobs lost in December, 99,000 were uh, women's jobs, uh, women jobs where women were employed. So women had to um, care about the families during the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, schools were closed, so they had to take care of children since a lot of uh, uh, facilities, uh, service facilities uh, supporting disabled people, for instance, they had to take care of uh, di the disabled. So, you know, this uh, unfair um, split um, about the family care uh, was uh, against women. And so also the policies for the conciliation of uh, uh, working and lifetime risk to find uh, in smart working a sort of shortcut. So uh, they used to say, okay, we have smart working, so women at home can go on continue working and also take care of children who were not going uh, to school. And this is a shortcut that uh, also uh, after uh, the pandemic, uh, we should not uh, consider because smart working uh, was uh, uh, an emergency was very useful uh, in order not to uh, stop uh, the site in general, but this cannot be a, a tool used in order to have women stay at home because uh, women uh, works uh, uh, working outside home, out of home is uh, something that uh, they have to go through. And the other uh, weakness uh, of uh, the with regard to the resilience and recovery plan. So with regard to the women's employment, it does not so much. As for uh, women's entrepreneurship, they allocated 400 million, really peanuts. Peanuts, I repeat it, because uh, this is not going to change things so much. And then uh, it was uh, calculated that if uh, a fair employment, so same um, uh, same number of women, men and women uh, employed, then uh, the GDP of our country would increase by uh, 11 uh, points. Uh, so this is part of the uh, green culture. The GDP is not uh, a, um, an instrument which measures the uh, people's happiness, uh, but uh, the volume uh, of the economic activity produced. And so it includes also negative uh, issues uh, or things like uh, uh, expenses in order to repair cars uh, um, uh, that when ran into an accident, etc. So these are not really <laughs> steps going towards uh, human happiness. In any case, uh, uh, they indicate uh, a, uh, the health or the state of health of uh, an economy. In any case, with regard to the gender balance uh, that should increase 11 points, uh, like 11 points GDP, this plan is not doing enough. And so this plan risks to be the uh, another uh, lost opportunity in order to facilitate uh, women's employment, because the more women we have on the market, considering also that uh, women, when uh, uh, get graduated, they've got uh, uh, higher marks uh, um, compared to uh, men. So, uh, you know, competing, uh, getting to the uh, gender equality then would uh, entail more skills and competencies. Uh, that's why the uh, OECD is calculating this increase in the GDP by 11 points. Then we have another weak point, another weakness. This is to say the uh, um, allocation of resources in order to have uh, the highest number of children 
in uh, kindergarten. So in this way, women uh, should not uh, care, take care of uh, children and uh, go to work because in Italy, the um, uh, leave, uh, um, father's leave and mother's leave, uh, father's leave, sorry, are limited to 11 days. And so women have to take care of children. So besides uh, being uh, very educational for children, uh, so it is also uh, the possibility to overcome social differences, you know, because uh, um, with the other environments uh, which are more which are wealthier etc because the uh, child um, when he's small when he's a kid uh, can be oriented towards a certain type of services uh, services which are certainly educational so now the situation of italy uh, records that 25% of uh, children go to the kindergarten without, uh, and, and then we have to consider a big gap between uh, northern Italy uh, regions and southern Italy regions. Uh, with the investment uh, of uh, the uh, um, recovery and resilience plan uh, of 3.6 billion in uh, six years, we'll get to we'll get uh, to 33%. As you say, we'll reach uh, the uh, European target of 17 years ago. So we are not going to advance to progress. Then in terms of uh, um, the care work, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is important to be emphasized. It's not just delivering a service, but it's really, um, we have also to consider the uh, affection, love, uh, which is involved. Uh, and uh, law 328, uh, 328, as you say, the law, uh, this law, after 20 years from its approval, has not been implemented yet. Uh, so it means that uh, women, uh, um, with respect to uh, disabled uh, uh, family uh, members uh, um, do work uh, because there are no public services available. And then 57% of the recovery and resilience plan uh, Consider uh, considers the uh, green objectives and the digitalization and green uh, targets uh, uh, for us and for you, for all of us, uh, are really uh, extremely important. But the fact that uh, they have not been accompanied by what Alexander Geza requested to say with the priority for the green targets for digitalization, but integrated with the objective of the gender balance, of the gender equality, so that in Italy, since uh, we have basically more men uh, working, then uh, we risk uh, once again to uh, create a barrier against the, uh, uh, the fact of uh, uh, overcoming the gender gap. Then last thing I wanted to mention, the uh, funds um, for uh, to fight uh, women's violence, violence against women uh, would not allow us to achieve the targets of Istanbul because in Italy, uh, feminicides are really um, part of our daily routine. Recently, we've seen also uh, cases which are really painful because they also involve a minor, for instance, a minor who has uh, killed, who has murdered a, uh, um, a teenager near Bologna. And so this indicates uh, that uh, young people have suffered really a lot from the uh, lockdown. So with the um, this uh, Ikomori syndrome, this uh, uh, social isolation, uh, high depression, uh, anxiety, uh, food disorders. Uh, um, so this is another big problem left by uh, the uh, COVID pandemic. And we need to uh, find a solution to that because others, otherwise we have uh, a... Uh, mm, an entire generation which gets uh, burned out. And then young people in Italy, and in particular the young uh, Italian girls, uh, Italian young girls uh, are really um, already suffering this problem of uh, um, young underemployment situation. So we have a strong problem in term between generations. So I, we don't believe that the national plan, Italian national plan uh, gave satisfactory uh, responses to these problems. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sina, for
Helena, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure for us to, to be here with you and to join this event for the Green Recovery. I'm pleased uh, that one of the panels is dedicated to a recovery for the people, social and gender equality. And the reason is that the coronavirus uh, pandemic has reminded us that gender equality is not a side issue. And let, uh, let me please give you a few examples to illustrate this. So we know from our research at the European Institute for Gender Equality that after five years of growth at EU level, employment has declined for both, for women and men in all EU member states since the start of the pandemic. Also employment rates started to raise again last summer, men still gain twice as many jobs compared to women, which indicates a trend of longer lasting economic consequences for women. Young, lower educated and migrant women were left especially far behind in the labor market. But in addition to these economic consequences, there have been social ones as well. Work-life balance conflicts have increased for many parents. Mental stress and burnout, especially for mothers of young children trying to combine telework, supervision of online classes and childcare is a serious concern. And it is a concern, not just because both women and men should be able to balance their work, their family and their personal life, but also because what goes on in the home is of course inseparable from what goes on in the economy. Our research shows that across the EU, more than half of women, exactly 53% of women of childbearing age who are not in paid work, say that the main reason they cannot look for a job is because of family responsibilities. When it comes to men, the figure is 8%. Clearly, the allocation of recovery money needs to recognize the different life experiences and realities of women and men in all their diversity. At the end of the day, Europe will bounce back from this pandemic, but gender equality must be front and center of recovery measures if we are truly committed to strengthening the resilience of our society and our economies. We know, Egan knows from, from our study on the economic benefits of gender equality, that more gender equality would spur economic growth, as it was uh, said before, but also job creation. And reducing inequalities in the labor market, in pay and in STEM education would generate up to 10.5 million additional jobs by 2050 and push the EU employment rate up to 80%. So the fact speaks for, them, for, for, for themselves. It is clear that gender equality, apart from being a core value of the EU, makes a uh, socioeconomic sense. As Europe looks for ways to recover from the social and the economic consequences that have affected the lives of citizens across Europe, there is an urgent need to mainstream gender into the reform agenda of the member states. And how can we use the RRF, the resilience and the recovery facility to fight against social and economic and gender equalities? How can member states take up a gender responsive approach? Well, 
at this stage of the process, when uh, the national plans have been sent and, and, and reviewed already by, by the Commission, to ensure a gender responsive recovery, member states must involve gender equality bodies in their national structures responsible for coordinating recovery efforts. Our research shows that despite long-standing record of gender equality commitments, application of gender mainstreaming is still very fragmented across the EU. So more support to and involvement of gender equality bodies and gender experts would ensure the gender mainstreaming and the use of gender mainstreaming tools, such as gender impact assessment, gender budgeting, and gender recover or gender responsive public procurement becomes the regular practice of recovery budgeting, policy making, and program implementation. And here I want to link with the structural funds because actually experience from the structural funds research from uh, the analysis of how gender mainstreaming has been implemented in the funds shows that there is scope for strengthening gender mainstreaming in all phases of programming, implementation, budgeting, and monitoring. So to do that, collection and use of sex disaggregated data is crucial to understand the different effects of the pandemic on women and men and to send the recovery money where it's most needed. In addition, adding gender equality indicators to the six pillars of the recovery and facility scoreboard would ensure that member states monitor how the implementation of the plans tackle gender inequalities and report against gender equality objectives. Member states can also make use of the technical support instrument that Commission rolled out yesterday. They can request support to effectively mainstream gender into their reform agenda. Commission has included one flagship initiative on gender mainstreaming in public policy and budget processes, and member states can use it to take up gender equality projects and support. At the end of the day, as I said before, we know that Europe will bounce back from this pandemic, but to witness a sustainable and fair recovery, one that takes into account the sustainability of life and improves the lives of women and men, girls and boys in all their diversity, gender equality and mainstreaming must be central to the implementation and monitoring of all recovery measures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helena, and thank you very much also for mentioning all those matter, measures. Um, I, will, I will comment on that in a second. Just um, to the audience, this is the time now to raise your hands or uh, to introduce questions in the Q&A tool. We have half an hour left, more or less. So please ask your questions now, because usually questions are concentrated on the last five minutes, and then we won't have time to answer them all. So just break the ice and go. Um, I just wanted to comment a little bit on what Helena said. Um, it was very good to hear that the commission has chosen like a flagship project for gender mainstream because I was the rapporteur on the technical support instrument. And I remember long hours of negotiation in order to make sure gender budgeting and the gender tracking and the gender mainstreaming measures were explicitly mentioned because there was quite some resistance. So it's very good to hear that in the end we have an outcome. And I think we have on that front, we have really, really good news because we, we do know we have the gender tracking now in the multi-annual financial framework of the European Union. So um, the, the basic budget that is even bigger than the RRF and that's continuous. So we will have results um, in, in a few, well, not exactly month, but a year or two to start to see the results of the gender tracking. And I think that would be uh, very, very interesting to see where the money goes and how we can shift resources in order to improve our, our funding, our investments, basically. And on the, um, the RRF and the monitoring, um, we passed a resolution a couple of weeks ago as Parliament asking very strongly for sex disaggregated data for the social storeboard and all the monitoring instruments. So I think that is very is going to be very important as well, at least to have these numbers and have to be able to make evidence-based policy. Because we, you know, when we speak among us, we all know that um, having more women on the labor market, having uh, a more equal distribution of paid and unpaid work would boost growth but um, when you speak you know when when you listen to who makes then the plans for the economy um, it's, it's very ideological to deny that 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 kind of research doesn't seem to exist 
And then we say, well, the economy is neutral. Um, what do women have to do with it? <laughs> so I think it would be very, very important to have those indicators and to have that data in order to, to have better policies. Um, I wanted to ask Luca one thing because I was a little bit baffled um, that job creation is not mentioned very often. And usually when you want to, to combat an economic crisis, it's about employment. It's a lot about employment. And this is not being mentioned very often. And we don't have, um, there wasn't a requirement to really uh, indicate how many jobs would be created by the plans, by the measures, which I think would have been important. You as, um, in terms of trade unions, have you been able to make an educated guess of how many jobs more or less will be created? Is that going to be adequate? And especially for whom are the social jobs being created? Because there's one interesting point in the social expenditure, that is that 50% of it is healthcare and education respectively 25 and 25. And when Celine Gower, the head of the task force came to explain this in parliament, she said, well, you know, it's 50% just going into those two sectors. Employment is 8% just to give you the idea. Um, it's because it goes into infrastructure. It's con construction work, basically. It's because um, the recovery and resilience facility cannot pay for a permanent cost. So they cannot, it cannot pay for staff that will then have to be hired for 10 years. And this is why a lot of money actually goes into construction. So I was a little bit wondering if even in the social sector, half the money goes into construction. Um, for whom are um, other jobs being created? Do, do you have any idea from what you have seen from the plans? Well, unfortunately, there are no figures on this. And by the way, this is a very old story because uh, I perfectly remember the discussions and even the arguments we had with Jean-Claude Juncker when he launched, you remember probably, his uh, famous Juncker plans, one, two, three. And uh, uh, we insisted so much at that time to make sure that uh, uh, the investment that was uh, envisaged in these plans uh, should have been linked uh, to very clear, uh, uh, let's say, uh, monitoring uh, uh, elements and targets uh, for uh, job creation. And uh, the Commission basically refused to introduce any targets by saying, uh, well, uh, investing money will automatically create jobs. Uh, uh, and, and then they say, and then we don't know how to uh, register and monitor uh, the level of job creation because most of this money will go uh, to the private sector. Uh, and so we cannot ask uh, the companies or put as a conditionality the number of uh, jobs created uh, to measure, let's say, the performance they will uh, deliver uh, in the framework of these recovery plans. And unfortunately, despite of the fact that everybody says we have, we have to avoid the mistakes we made in the past, et cetera, et cetera, then when it comes to practicalities and how to monitor, in fact, uh, quality job creation, there is still a totally denial attitude uh, from the European and national institutions in doing so. Uh, because what you, have, you, what you underlined is exactly the contradiction we are facing. That on the one side, all the investment that goes uh, to public sector cannot finance directly job creation because the money cannot go for staff costs. It can just be, for, be used for infrastructure uh, investment or structural reforms uh, to, let's say, increase the efficiency and the performances of the public services. But uh, no money can be used to support uh, uh, employment creation. And so long term, I mean, uh, uh, new jobs, I mean, in the, in the public administration, because this is considered something that can be done only through public budgets. So the European money cannot be spent for that. On the other side, they say, well, the, the money for job creation will be invested in private sector. But when it goes to the private sector, the European Commission and also governments uh, apparently don't have any tools, I mean, and any monitoring mechanisms, I mean, to make sure that uh, there is a measurable effect and impact in terms of job creation. So they don't, uh, they cannot tell you how many jobs a specific company can really create. That's why um, we think that the only way to sort it out is really to put some conditionalities for funding. Uh, because if you don't put conditionalities ex ante in a way that if a company receives a certain amount of money, should not dismiss workers and on the contrary, should create jobs opportunities and the public administration should make sure that the services are 
delivered at a certain level of quality, et cetera, et cetera. And all infrastructure investments uh, should create a certain number of, jo of jobs. And this is something that you can measure. So if you don't put this as ex ante conditionalities, then there is no monitoring mechanism that is able to rebalance a situation that is biased from the really beginning. That's why we are insisting so much on the concept of uh, 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 social and employment uh, ex ante conditionalities to be linked to funding. And if there is not the commission imposing this, it's impossible to ask the member states to include this uh, in their own national recovery plans. So it's really uh, about the control and monitoring from the unit uh, of uh, Mrs. Gower that this kind of push should come. The problem we are facing, unfortunately, I, I have to say this very clearly, is that uh, the approach that comes from uh, Cecile Gower and her unit is very old fashioned. Uh, is really Barroso style, you know, uh, is coming back to the, this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, austerity, austerity uh, uh, biased uh, uh, approach from the past. Uh, and uh, they essentially refuse to introduce these elements into there, despite of the obligations that come from the social scoreboard, to from the action plan on for the implementation of the pillar of social rights, from the fact that these tools are mentioned in the regulation and the guidelines that the European Commission has issued to member states uh, for them to take all this into account in, in shaping the, and designing their national recovery plans, uh, then the, the commission itself is not implementing and making sure that member states implement uh, their own guidelines. So there is a total mismatch of uh, good intentions and very uh, weak, uh, uh, let's say, monitoring and conditionality mechanisms uh, being implemented. And I have also to say that since all this uh, lays under the responsibility of the president of the European Commission and the Secretariat General, even commissioners like Schmidt, Gentiloni, Timmermans and others that would like to introduce these elements of uh, social and employment and environmental conditionalities, well, they have very little say even within the commission to make sure that all this happens. That's why I really think that we should increase our political pressure because otherwise it will be just something managed by bureaucrats in secret rooms under closed doors, behind closed doors with no possibility for democratic accountability and civil society and politicians outside these closed rooms uh, for having an influence and an impact on the whole process. So it's really an emergency call, the one that I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, telling you because uh, um, we see that there is really very, very little opportunity to be, to, be, to be involved, to have the possibility to enter into this decision-making process. So we really need to, to raise our voices to make sure that we can be loud in this, in this respect. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, that is indeed a problem that we don't have the figures and we don't have the conditionalities. Um, I would maybe there like to defend a little bit the task force led by Celine Gower that I think is, is working very, very hard in this moment in order to monitor 27 plans in, in basically a few weeks. Um, and she has been coming to Parliament every week or two times a week um, to report on the progress, on the plans and so on. So I think what she has is, is a political problem. I think what, what really um, needs to be done, what, what she's saying on gender, we have the, exactly the same issue that they're not even implementing what is in their own guidelines. Um, what Celine Gower is telling us, well, I need a legal basis in order to do that because the member states know very well what the legal basis is. And in terms of gender, it is true that in the, uh, in the regulation, there's, there's very little. There's this gender mainstreaming, it's very general. So I think what worked was to have the minimum shares for the green transition and for the digital transition. So when you really have numbers, you really have standards by which you can measure them. Uh, do no significant harm is, is sort of working because you have a very clear standard by which to measure it and then you get it done. And probably we need that in the employment part in the social part and in the gender part as well. This is, this is a little bit the problem I'm seeing that these were member states making up basically their own rules for how to spend the money and they didn't want strings attached. Um, and the parliament managed to come up with some strings at least on the conditionalities on the green on the digital and so on. And I think that was a great success, but we didn't managed to, to get everything. So um, I, I totally join in, but I think it's not in, in your call. Um, 
maybe it's not a good idea to say it's the bureaucrats. What really is lacking is the political will from many member states' governments. And there, I totally agree, who didn't want that. And this is, I think, what we have to change and what we have to work on. Yeah, but can I tell you something very briefly? Uh, where was the legal basis during the austerity period for the European Commission through the country-specific recommendations uh, to impose uh, wage cuts, uh, collective bargaining dismantle, uh, uh, horrible pension reforms, uh, uh, cuts in social protection? I mean, there was no legal basis at that time, but nevertheless, the semester and, and all the other tools were used in a very aggr aggressive manner to impose to member states uh, 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 some measures that otherwise they would never have implemented. And what was the leverage? The money. So this leverage exists even more in the framework of the uh, new generation EU and the recovery and resilience facility. If they want to do it, they can do it. It's a matter, as you said rightly, of political willingness. But it's not only the political willingness of the government, it's also the political willingness of the commission, in my opinion. Yeah. We've been we've been complaining as well that the, even the C CSRs on gender equality, which you know they have you have a legal basis there because they are clearly in the regulation have not been implemented strongly. The measures included in the plans to address them, even in those countries that have gender CSRs, are ridiculous. Um, so yeah, agree on that one. Um, let's take a question from the audience. Um, Monica Frassoni is asking, what are the means for the EP and in general for public opinion to monitor progress on gender? in the RF. I have the impression that commission was a little was a little active on the green issue, not so much on this one. Yeah, I have that same impression as well. I totally share that, Monica. Um, what we have in terms of parliament is the monitoring group on the recovery and resilience um, facility, which I'm part of, and the people sharing these, these panels. Um, you have seen Anna, Damian, and you will see Vaz, and then there's Jorge. And um, we are following what's going on. Obviously, we can't read 27 plans in the original and really have a profound analysis. So we rely a little bit on um, the, the analysis that the commission is doing. And the commission has shared some material on that. On gender specifically, um, as Green Group, we asked the uh, EPRS, which is the research service of the European Parliament, to give us an overview um, of the measures that are in the plans. And this is the basis on which we, we I'm, I've been speaking in the past days and weeks to say that the measures to address gender inequality contained in the plans are absolutely insufficient. And we also compared them to the country specific recommendations on gender. And this is why I was able to say a few minutes ago that we think that the measures contained in the plans are not adequate, even not to um, the, the country specific recommendations and even less to the general need for gender mainstream streaming in the plans. And um, we will be active in the future on this. I think it's very important that we, we get that information from the member states because we need to hear it from stakeholders. Um, I'm working, I commissioned a gender impact assessment for the Italian plan. I'm still trying to get one for the German plan. We had an agreement a few days ago um, to talk about a gender impact assessment for the Polish plan. So I think that would be three very interesting countries um, to have a gender impact assessment for. And I think we will continue to work on this. And then obviously will be the social scoreboard um, with um, the indicators and the, the EP strongly requested sex disaggregated indicators. And it would, would be good to, um, you know, to focus on that from a point of civil society organization as well to call from that. IGA is doing that very strongly. So that was, that was a question directed to me. That was my uh, answer. There's another question um, in view. This is a very Italian debate today. In view of the debate, especially vibrant in Italy on gender identity, how are transgender people considered within the context of gender parity protection? How is this approach and is it approached? Um, in terms of the RRF, I think it is not approached, I have to say. I can't remember. I don't know if Ige can comment on that. I don't remember being it mentioned, actually. I know it's a specific Italian debate, therefore I can maybe just answer it from a point of view of the Green Party, which is maybe what is requested here. Um, for us protection, um, we totally support the idea of, of gender identity and gender transgender people. I mean, people are free to choose the gender and this is exactly what we support as, as a Green European Party, if that was the question. just want to make the statement, but this is um, has nothing to do with the topic of the of the recovery and resilience plans where this is not not considered. 
Um, another question, there's a lot of discussion on creation of national environment civil services, similar to what Biden is implementing. Both Rosella Muroni and Eleonora Eri have advanced proposals on this. Would it be possible for this to be implemented as a transporter European initiative throughout Europe under the recovery fund? Um, would anybody from the panel like to answer that? Seeing Luca, no, I don't know, Silvia, probably not either. Um, I, oh, I can, Silvia, go ahead. Uh, well, well, this is an old dream, the fact of creating civil services on a European basis, uh, also as a tool to create the European citizenship. And I believe that it was a, a um, proposal by Daniel Convendit, Daniel Convendit, um, without considering the age. Uh, I mean, uh, creating this sort of uh, uh, education training, sort of saying, uh, for the European citizenship. I don't believe that this has been already implemented, but it could be worth uh, um, considering it. I think that this uh, could be a relevant, re I don't know if it is relevant for the purposes of the national plans. Uh, national recovery and resilience plans. In any case, it could be an idea, a tool to uh, educate and uh, to train uh, Europeans. Uh, it is like uh, the young guys, you, uh, you know, the Erasmus uh, uh, self, uh, was self-financed uh, because uh, uh, after graduating, I uh, uh, went to Berlin where I met the uh, Green uh, Party, the Green Experience, uh, which marked my life. And and then, uh, so, you know, this uh, experience is abroad are fundamental because when you go back to your country, you are uh, more uh, ready to live with the uh, people coming from other countries uh, uh, since you have uh, already the experience of being a uh, foreign person in a foreign country, then uh, you are ready to live in uh, multi-ethnic uh, and multi-race society, societies. I think that this is a fundamental experience. Yes, uh, Swiss, uh, the Swiss um, um, goes for uh, military services uh, uh, the whole life. Uh, we may think about uh, a civil service, European civil service, uh, not concerning only young people, but a sort of uh, uh, training, self-training for European citizenship. Uh, why not having this dream? Because what uh, Sylvia just said uh, reminded me about a proposal that um, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker made at the end of his mandate with this white book that he presented, uh, you remember probably about the future of Europe uh, before the idea of the conference was uh, launched. And uh, among the different proposals, there was a proposal for an European civil service that should have involved some 100,000 young people in a certain period of time. It was not environmental, eh? it was more generic uh, as uh, Sylvia was mentioning uh, uh, as a principle. But frankly speaking, I don't know if then this proposal was actually implemented. Maybe you from the parliament have more information on this. I don't know. It, it was implemented. That what, what, what was I was trying to say to Silvia. Um, it's good to dream, but it's also good to implement things. And this actually has been implemented. There is a program for European voluntary service. I'm, um, I think it is still very small and I'm not sure about the details. I, it's ongoing, it's still small and I think we wanted to increase this, but I'm, I'm sorry, I was not working on that file. So I, I don't remember the exact details, but this exists. And I think there is like a sub program on the environment. I think to do environmental voluntary service is one of the options, but I don't quote me on that one. Um, but I can I can check with a colleague on what's going on that program who followed that and this is existing it's called the, uh, the European Voluntary Service I think um, but just you know just try to, to look for it in the internet this exists and this is definitely a program that we are supporting very very strongly um, maybe what could be interesting to one of our proposals is to have it, it can't be financed and that was the question actually under the under the recovery and resilience facility. 
because the Recovery and Resilience Facility basically um, gives member states the possibility to draw up these plans and spend the money themselves. So it's not, it's European money, but it's being spent by the member states according to uh, conditions. And it's not a program where the European Commission can or the European Parliament can decide how to spend the money together. But that might be a great, not even dream, but a project for the future. Because um, we, there is the idea around to have uh, a permanent funding, a permanent facility uh, to combat climate change, for example, um, and to, uh, to address these, these huge common European challenges in terms of infrastructure, in terms of social protection networks, for example. Um, and that could go beyond 2025, 2026 and continue or come in in that phase. So that's an idea. You know, once we started with the idea of having common European debt, which is being very successful, this is something we can continue. And I think a European environmental voluntary service would be a perfect component of such an idea for, for the near future. So thanks for the participant who came up with the idea. It can't be implemented right now, but I think we can, we can take it forward and use it as an idea to, to implement in the future. Are there any other questions from the audience? I don't see yeah, them. Alessandra, see. Sí. Maybe Alessandra, Alexandra, not only uh, exclusively related to the environmental sector, but also um, the, the fact of uh, creating, uh, you know, exchanges at this level, it would be important in order to uh, strengthen, consolidate, you know, uh, uh, Europe and uh, make it... Um, increase the cohesion. Uh, then the discussion we had uh, at the Legislative Assembly uh, of Emilia Romagna, the so-called ascendant uh, uh, debate, uh, that you say, um, we introduced uh, the uh, gender assessment uh, um, impact, uh, impact assessment, the gender impact assessment. Uh, this is extremely important uh, because you can measure uh, beforehand uh, the um, effects of an investment uh, on women and uh, men. So this may be a preventive uh, uh, assessment uh, instrument in order to overcome the gender gap. And uh, I made, uh, I raised a motion at the um, um, council, uh, at the region council. So we have a tool which is uh, different from the uh, gender balance because this uh, intervenes on the single project, on the single investments. And this uh, may be extremely useful. So I believe that uh, we uh, make uh, a gender impact assessment in our recovery very real uh, and resilient plan, we would not have uh, such a big result. Gender impact assessments for the national plans, and I think the outcome would have been very different, not only for women, but especially for people with lower income, for uh, employment, job creation. I think we would have had a better outcome in the end, but I mean, we lost that one, but we're still working on it. And thanks for that contribution, Sylvia. And thanks to Rosa, Rosa D'Amato, who posted the link um, in the chat, I think probably to our request or our campaign for European Environmental Service. So if you want to know more about that, just click on the link in the chat and you get more information and a better answer to your question. And with this, I think I'm, we are, uh, yeah, we have one minute. Um, does anybody want to make just a final quick statement in the last minute? Then I will do that. Um, great. So um, I think that the social dimension, the job dimension, and especially the gender dimension of the recovery and resilience facility from a green point of view are definitely um, not good enough. We have to keep working on that. And thanks for Luca, who is in this initial input called for this, this alliance in order to improve exactly those aspects. And we have to to garner and foster the political will to really do that. And I think it's very important for people to understand that the green transition and the green and the digital transition uh, have to go hand in hand with the social, the social transition and the social dimension that has to be considered. Um, not only because the climate crisis hits people with low incomes hardest, but only those way that way the measures will be acceptable. We will have a 
a cohesive society that really goes forward together and gender equality is one of the very, is, is a very strong dimension in here. And I think one of the big issues um, with the recovery and resilience plans where the lack of involvement of stakeholders, social stakeholders, local stakeholders, I think the plans would have been a lot better if we had taken time. I know everything was urgent, but to take the time to consult with local stakeholders and social partners and uh, women's organizations um, and to come up with plans that are more detailed, more thought through and benefit really the whole of society. But we will keep working on this together in the monitoring and developing better ideas. I think we need a very strong economic framework that Luca has um, sort of set out but we also need the participation of, of very different stakeholders in society at all levels um, in order to come back to, to, to come up with a, with a better project for the future. And we have, we have seen that Europe, when it wants, is able to find the money. Because this is, I think, the great experience that in the crisis, we, we stick together and we have a great capacity of finding funding, of programming, and this is where the political work comes in, and this is why it's so important to have this conference and to bring, to bring all these different actors and stakeholders um, together in order to, to really create a, a different mood. And I see a lot of potential to do that in the next years, building on what we have now with the Recovery and Resilience Facility. With that, thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Helena. Thank you, Luca, for your important contributions. Thanks to everybody for listening and for the questions and the comments in the chat. And I give back the floor, I think, to Ma and Bas. Is that correct? I don't see your camera. Yes. On. Yes. yes, that's correct, um, yeah. Yeah. Alexandra. Thank you so much for having me. Good. Thank you. Um, we're arriving now to the end of uh, this uh, uh, long event, but very nice. Um, so it's my turn together with uh, Bas Eichhout to close this event. I want to first of all, congratulate all of you participants and panelists. This has been a very, very interesting conversation. Many panelists and interventions have featured the next generation and the recovery and resilience fund as an historical step of the European Union. Vula said it first, but then Sven made the, that reference in the second balance. We politicians are very often accused of abusing of the term historical while talking about important issues. But I believe that the, in this particular occasion, we're talking about the ORF, we are not exaggerating at all. I strongly believe that, that it is an historical step forward in the history of the European Union project. The reason being is the simple fact that in the whole history of the European Union, there was never, never before such an answer to a crisis. Yes, it's true, the COVID-19 pandemic is and has been a crisis beyond any imaginable circumstances. But the answer that the EU is giving, even if it's, um, yeah, we've been appointing all of the challenges today, but the, this answer is also extremely exceptional and also unimaginable only some months ago. So what a difference the EU austerity response to 2018 financial crisis to this one, and what a difference in terms of solidarity and shared commitments among the members of the European Union. And that is probably the reason why we really need to get this well done. Yeah? It is a historical step also because never before the European Union linked the funds to the respect of the rule of law or the fight against climate change. And in that sense, as, as Alexandra has been uh, saying in this last panel, it is a pity we did not manage to include gender also as a conditionality, but that will not impede us to keep fighting for the necessary adv advancements that uh, we still deserve. So as the current political moment in which we are, and as this conference has shown, the management and the implementation of the recovery funds is both going to be a challenge, but also an opportunity. Ernest mentioned at the very beginning of this conference, we want this to be the seed of the green transformation. So for the Greens, we believe that these funds should and need to be an effective instrument to tackle three serious problems. The challenge of climate change, the low levels of long-term growth, and the inequalities that COVID crisis has accentuated. The recovery and resilience funds, I said it before, is a good opportunity to solve the serious problems that we face. But it's important that we do it well. This explains the energies that the European Green Party and also the Greens EFA, especially the Greens EFA in the European Parliament have devoted to this issue. We have organized many sessions, events, speaks, discussions, 
We've also established dialogues with civil society, with social agents, with the academic world, and with representatives of institutions and administrations, with the special attention also to city councils and the local level in general. The Greens will not allow this opportunity to be missed, or at least will do as much as possible not to allow this opportunity to be missed. If the recovery fund meets its objectives, we will not only advance in solving some of the current problems and challenges, we will reorient growth patterns and we will be on the right track for consolidating the European project. I just learned right now that the far right parties have grouped themselves with the aim of creating the third biggest group in the European Parliament. So we really need to go or to orientate the European, the European project in the right path. Because at the end, things are not going that well. Huh? Take an example of what is the news today, the heat waves in Canada and in part of the US. We are running out of time to reverse global warming and the absence of certain brave decisions and commitments, some of which have been pointing out today, make me sometimes think the current EU leaders, but also some member state leaders are suffering from this Titanic orchestra syndrome. Yeah, The one that according to the legend kept playing and playing music while the ship was sh shrinking. So the planet must not, not be a Titanic. It cannot be uh, shipwrecked by the irresponsibility and uh, predatory greed of some. We the Greens and uh, fortunately more and more people will fight to prevent this from happening. Finally, um, I just want to refer to the need to go beyond the commitment of national governments. It has been mentioned today a lot of times. We must not forget the role of local level uh, in the fight against climate change and, should, and how this, uh, they should play a role, an important role in the implementation of part of these funds. A good governance of the fund requires transparency and monitoring and uh, some interventions have well pointed out the necessary also participation of civil society and the necessary transparency that we still don't see fully in these national recovery uh, plans. In that regard, the commitments of the Greens is twofold. On the one hand, we will fulfill our political and institutional responsibilities in the governance and control of the management of the funds at all institutional levels. But on the other hand, we want to be the channel for political participation also in the follow-up of this management and implementation of the fund. We uh, aware, we're aware that uh, about what is at stake, and that's a lot. And uh, we're also aware that the success will not be achieved without the complicity of many people. I would like to uh, end my uh, intervention and then give the floor to Bas only with a quote that I thought that uh, was relevant for today from Walter Benjamin, uh, this German philosopher that said that uh, Marx affirms that revolutions are the locomotive of history. But uh, maybe now things are different. Perhaps revolutions are about activating the handbrake of the train in which humanity is traveling. So paraphrasing Walter Benjamin, a green revolution probably is needed to activate the emergency brake. And this fund should be a first stop to avoid going back to the business as usual. So thank you very much. And uh, Bas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mark. And what can I add to that, isn't it? Now, I, I, I think I would like to start by thanking everyone for this very important workshop and, and webinar that we were having today. And that's from our perspective also is going to be the first one. Because indeed, I think every round around the table here is agreeing. This is an historic chance to get it right. And we have had never before such a political support for a European investment program, what this RF basically is. Um, but there are many countries still not fully convinced that this should be continued. And me coming from the Netherlands, I can tell you, my government is still hoping that this will be a one-time off event. And after two years, it's done and countries should do it by themselves again. And that is exactly what we need to fight, what we will have to fight. We need a European investment program looking at the challenges that we all have as a European society. And I think today we've had many of these issues, talking about fighting inequalities, talking about upholding our European values, talking about creating a new economy, new job creation. That is what this is about. And of course, there is a responsibility for national member states, but 
also for the investments needed, we need a European investment program for that. And therefore, we will fight to make sure that this RRF will not be a one-time thing, but that this will be the start of a continuous, generous European investment program. And that's also why we need to get it right, because there are too many uh, countries, individuals, political parties who hope that this will not succeed so that they can easily give arguments why it should be stopped. And this is also why transparency and public participation is so crucial, because this will not succeed only by European action only. And this is, I think, sometimes a bit of a danger that we see in Brussels, is that member states fight a lot until something has been agreed, and then it's kind of, okay, Brussels, you arrange it and you make it happen. And this is a bit what we see in now the first national recovery plans. They are not, and I would stress that, they are not a, a genuine next generation attempt. The entire idea that this would be the creation of a, of a kind of investment program bringing us to a next generation EU, we're not there yet. Too often, member states just see this now as a next, as an additional European fund that they can use for plans they had put on the shelves for a while ago. And we still need really a serious attempt to really make sure that the investments are truly a next generation investment. And there we cannot only rely on you know, someone told about it, had the, the European, the Brussels bureaucrats. If the willingness is not there in the national capitals to sincerely come up with ideas how to transform your national economy, then we cannot only steer that from Brussels. And this is why these kind of events are so important, because it's only a stepping stone from a truly European discussion done and combined with a Brussels debate, but with all the national capitals, how can we together really create that willingness and that urgency to come and to take a step to a next generation EU? And I think that is where we now are for. There was a lot of issues that, you know, you can say these are some problems with the start of the RRF. But now we have to make sure the coming years that the national plans that are indeed on some occasions talking about the social dimension, the gender dimension, but even when you look at digitalization and the green deal and the, the green uh, transition, even there we see that the national plans are not always this real transition that is needed. So during this implementation, we need to increase the pressure not only on Brussels, but maybe even more important, also on the national capitals. If you really want to make a success out of this, we have all a common and joint responsibility to make a success out of it. And therefore, this is really only the beginning of a journey that we are. It is a journey that for now is for three years. And let's make sure that those are national RRF plans in its implementation will be improved, will be strengthened and will be more delivering on our green transition, our digital transition and fighting the inequalities uh, in our societies. And that is exactly at the start where we are. And if we can push all the national capitals more in that direction, I am sure that governments like the Dutch will have difficulties in keeping this to a one-time-off event. And that is exactly what our aim is. So that's why also it is so crucial to have this public participation and this public involvement in order to make it a success. We're not there yet. We are starting only that journey. And we are happy to have done that in this webinar for the first time together. But be sure we will continue and there will be more follow-ups on this because, as I said, we're only at the beginning of the RRF and hopefully we see you all soon again in follow-ups and improvements of the implementation of this. Thank you all. And I think now, if we would be in a real-time uh, conference, I think this would be the lovely moment to start the drinks. Um, maybe we will all do that in our own room. It's a bit of a, a sad thing. So let's hope that after the summer break, we can do that together again. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a good weekend. Ciao. Recording.